If you like the story you can support the author on Patreon link is in the description. Chapter 01 Charles Doyle Marvel Cinematic Universe Non-Sacred Timeline Continental Hotel Penthouse Boss, there's a new assassination mission, $2 million. Are you considering it? A stunning blonde woman in a professional dress, resembling a secretary, stood in front of Charles Doyle. Her tone was calm as she spoke. Oh, $2 million. That's not a small price. Tell me the specifics of the mission first, and then I'll consider taking this $2 million job. You know me, I'm quite picky about mission targets. Sitting by the window, Charles held a square glass with whiskey in his hand. He slowly shifted his gaze from the outside view and looked at Ginny, who was speaking. T slash N, I omitted a few sentences due to offensive content. I will do so in the future chapters as well unless it affects the readability. But if you want to keep the chapters as it is, let me know. This time, the new bounty task is for John Wick. The employer wants him eliminated as soon as possible. The reward is $2 million. What do you think? Hearing the name John Wick, Charles Doyle's thoughts drifted into the distance. The guy who wiped out an entire gang over a dog. Is his storyline about to begin? Then he glanced at the photo of the target in Ginny's hand, confirming that it was this guy and not someone with the same name. Charles spun the square glass in his hand, looked at the amber liquid inside, took a sip, and calmly said, The price is too low, I won't take it. Why? Ginny was curious. You entered the business relatively late, so you might not have a complete understanding of many things. John Wick used to be the number one assassin in the assassin world, and he's a bit of a legend in the underworld. As Charles narrated, Ginny gained a direct understanding of the guy newly listed on the mission board. Then she nodded and said, Indeed, the price is too low. Then her gaze turned to Charles, then curiously asked, Master Ninja, compared to you. Charles, however, smiled and said, I and he aren't assassins from the same world. Although Charles didn't say it directly, his confident tone and carefree attitude clearly showed that he didn't regard John Wick's abilities highly. Ginny's eyes shimmered as she decided not to dwell on this task. Then she spoke, I'll go see if there are any other tasks suitable for you. Go ahead. Getting Charles's agreement, she turned and left the room, heading towards the direction of the hotel's task hall. Watching Ginny leave, Charles's gaze once again turned to the world outside the window. My name is Feng Yi, and I come from the Blue Star. While playing the Naruto mobile game, when I was trying to pull the new character card Hero of the Will of Fire, Jiraiya, I got so frustrated by the game's tactics that I died of anger on the spot after realizing I had spent 3,000 bucks without even gathering enough character fragments. As a result, I found myself somehow reborn in this world. Although the planet beneath his feet is still called Earth, it's not the same Earth where Charles used to reside. After all, in Times Square, those massive advertisements for Stark Industries stand out prominently, and on entertainment magazines, the latest Playboy cover girl is once again in the embrace of Tony Stark. This is the Marvel Universe, or in Charles's eyes, more like a multiverse dressed in the skin of the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Upon awakening to my past life's memories, I discovered myself, dressed in rags, appearing in a dilapidated alley in New York. I speculated that I might be an orphan or a runaway troublemaker. As for the infuriating Naruto mobile game that had driven me to my demise, it had transformed into a cheat, appearing in my consciousness. However, this accursed cheat, just like before, was maddening, continuously loading. Charles Doyle was adopted by a killer couple from the Continental Hotel, who then trained young six-year-old Charles as an assassin. The training from the killer couple was already twisted, especially for an adopted child like me it was even more vicious. If it wasn't for that endlessly loading cheat in my mind, serving as my motivation to persist, I might have died during the training long ago. During this time, as a young child, my hands were stained with blood early on. If I were a child who knew nothing, maybe during the training, I wouldn't have felt uncomfortable in my heart. I would have become a genuine killer. But coming from a place full of kindness, from the former land of China, this kind of life destroyed my values and reshaped my life. Back then, I had tried to escape, but unfortunately, my young body and the as-yet-awakened cheat led my only attempt to end in failure and severe punishment. Since then, I hadn't attempted to escape again. Life was like getting raped, if I couldn't change it, I'd choose to enjoy it. In this period, under the training of the killer couple, I quickly grew, mastering various killing skills, disguise, combat, 
tracking and counter-tracking, marksmanship, and even the physical chemistry related to assassination, without missing any aspect. As for the so-called mandatory education, from middle school to high school and university, they were completely out of my reach. After all, I wasn't that guy who loved drinking Pocky, and I didn't run into a big shot from the military coming to adopt me. Of course, the necessary basic education wasn't lacking. After all, as a professional assassin, I knew more knowledge than a student preparing for the college entrance examination, just different kinds of knowledge. Under the training of the killer couple, on my 18th birthday, I awakened my own cheat, the damned Naruto mobile game finally finished loading. In the same year, I completed my training as an assassin, and my name, Charles Doyle, came from the last name of my adoptive parents. Although I had sacrificed them, I still inherited their surname, and even became what they had hoped for an assassin of the Continental Hotel, a relatively famous one. After all, even before awakening the cheat, I had already become a registered professional assassin in high demand. Coupled with this cheat. After more than a decade of learning, Charles had no intention of changing careers. Chapter 02, Ninja It's been over three years since the cheat was awakened. Every time he opened the cheat, the game interface of Naruto would pop up, along with a message prompting to recharge and upgrade to VIP 10 and instantly receive Gara of the Sandstorm. However, over these three years, Charles had attempted countless times to recharge using different currencies such as US dollars, British pounds, rubles, and even precious metals like gold and diamonds. Unfortunately, none of these attempts yielded any results. Every time he tried to recharge, it would result in a failure notification. Three years had passed, and he had completely given up on the idea of leveling up. He even exchanged Chinese Yuan to give it a try, but it was still ineffective. Upon opening the Naruto game panel, what appeared before Charles was himself, along with an illusory night view of the Leaf Village. His initial character wasn't the standard Uzumaki Naruto but rather himself, Charles Doyle. Over these three years, he had learned how to use the cheat effectively. He could perform daily check-ins, which rewarded him with copper coins, prestige, explosive tags, soul jades, reincarnation stones, delicious ramen, as well as ninja recruitment scrolls and gold coins, which could only be obtained through recharging. Among these rewards, copper coins and prestige were used for practicing ninja arts and upgrading psychic creatures. Copper coins were especially important, as they were needed for upgrading ninja arts, strengthening equipment and upgrading secret scrolls. Fortunately, system rewarded copper coins and US dollars could be mutually exchanged at a 1 colon 1 ratio. This led to him primarily converting to copper coins over the years and not converting to US dollar, after all, copper coins were genuinely not enough. As for the so-called soul jades and reincarnation stones, they were used to enhance artifacts. However, he had no idea how to obtain artifacts. The ninja recruitment scrolls were scarce over the years, whether due to his bad luck or some other reason. Through daily check-ins, he could acquire only one or two a month. Sometimes, luck favored him, and he could get up to three in a month, while other times, only one. As for the elusive double sign-in bonus from days 1 to 12, it seemed to be beyond his reach. In terms of gold coins, he could acquire only 50 a month through daily check-ins. However, a standard recruitment scroll required 168 gold coins. Limited edition recruitment and privilege recruitment were even further out of reach. Features like team assaults, trial locations, the dual arena, rankings, point matches, abundance areas, and ninja tournaments all appeared grayed out in the game unavailable to him. It was unclear whether these features required specific conditions to unlock or some other prerequisites. Interestingly, ever since he joined the Continental Hotel Assassins Association, the organization's headquarters had been illuminated. Simultaneously, the task assembly hall was also illuminated. All the assassin contracts he accepted at the Continental Hotel would count in the task assembly hall. However, the task assembly hall required characters to accept the missions, and at most, three tasks could be accepted within a day. In other words, the possibility of wildly grinding tasks through the task assembly hall didn't exist. The mission's level was even determined here, classified as S, A, B, C, or D, with varying rewards for each level. The rewards differed for each task level. Nonetheless, the introduction of the task assembly hall allowed Charles to receive tasks other than assassinations protection, escort, transport, and search were all considered missions. Under these circumstances, outside the Continental Hotel, he established a firm named Charles Agency to accept the aforementioned tasks. 
he selectively accepted tasks that were recognized by the task assembly hall. In addition to this, the system also provided a self-operated training ground. This training ground wasn't a place for battling in-game but a real training ground from the world of Naruto, much like the 8th training ground. Here, Charles could practice ninjutsu, taijutsu, genjutsu, shuriken throwing, and other techniques. The only drawback was the absence of combat, which prevented him from gaining practical experience. Through training in this field over the years, he had significantly improved his strength. Practicing ninjutsu in this training ground had proven to be more than useful. Regarding ninja recruitment, he had acquired a total of 50 ninja recruitment scrolls over the course of three years. Following the practice of his previous life, he waited until he accumulated 10 scrolls before using them collectively. After all, not every ninja recruitment scroll guaranteed the acquisition of a ninja or ninja fragments. Some scrolls rewarded copper coins, prestige, equipment materials, and more. However, over the years, he had managed to acquire only three ninjas. The reason for not acquiring more was that when duplicate recruitment occurred, the duplicate ninja would transform into fragments. B rank or higher ninjas were transformed into 15 fragments, while C rank ninjas transformed into 10 fragments. For C rank ninjas not yet acquired, 10 identical fragments could be synthesized into a recruitment. As for B rank ninjas, it required 40 identical ninja fragments. Similarly, A rank ninjas also required 40 identical ninja fragments. However, S rank ninjas demanded a staggering 100 identical ninja fragments. There seemed to be no consistent pattern. Additionally, ninjas could be promoted in star level, ranging from 1 star to the highest level of 5 stars. Promoting from 1 star to 2 stars required 30 fragments. For 2 stars to reach 3 stars, 60 fragments were needed. 3 stars to 4 stars required 100 fragments. Finally, 4 stars to 5 stars necessitated 200 fragments. While each star promotion improved the character's overall attributes, the difficulty was immense, especially in his case with the presence of this kind of cheat. Obtaining character fragments was truly a daunting task. Although the ninjas he obtained were all C-rank, which were considered trash in the mobile game, they were significant forces in the early stages of the Marvel world. The three ninjas he possessed. One Uchiha Suzuki, without Sharingan, skills, fire style, great fireball jutsu, lion combo, Chidori. 2. Iruka Umino. Skills, Teaching, Barrier Formation, Roar of Love. 3. Rock Lee. Skills, Infinite Dance, Leaf Hurricane, Lotus Blossom. For the recruited ninjas, he could use all their skills, while also acquiring the standard C-rank ninja chakra quantity. Additionally, he himself could cultivate chakra. The only frustrating part was that even though this Suzuki could already use Chidori, he lacked the Sharingan. This move was truly a game changer. Only when he successfully recruited Suzuki with the Sharingan could he obtain the Sharingan. This way, he could keep up with Chidori's rapid advancement. Although among these three one was Chiyunin level ninja, with two being Genin level, the strength they exhibited in a Marvel universe that hadn't yet experienced significant events was remarkable. As long as they weren't hit directly by firearms or explosives, their assassination abilities were indeed formidable. After all, Common ninjas were low in defense but high in attack power. Chapter 03, John Wick T slash N, in case you might get confused, MC's name has been changed from Charlotte Doyle to Charles Doyle as the previous name was kind of feminine. These recruited ninjas, when given the opportunity to fight, could truly manifest and become living beings in the Marvel world. The world of anime converging with reality. Apart from initially having one battle slot, opening each additional slot required the use of gold coins. Over the course of three years, all the gold coins obtained from signing in had been invested into opening battle slots, ultimately resulting in just two more slots being unlocked. The three manifested ninjas, including himself, could form a team of four. As long as he had enough battle slots, he could even bring all the ninja characters into the Marvel world. Manifested characters possessed their own intelligence, but they were completely loyal to the summoner. If they weren't completely loyal, Charles wouldn't dare to bring them into the real world. After all, some ninjas were capable of various tricky operations. As for summoning techniques, he had currently only unlocked summoning the ninja dogs. As for the later options like the snake, toad, or even tailed beasts, they made him feel envious, but he hadn't even maxed out his training with the ninja dogs. However, that would change soon. With a bit of reputation, 
he could max out the training for the ninja dogs and unlock the summoning of the next creature, the blue snake. After checking his personal information, Charles took a sip of his whiskey and lay down on the bed, slowly falling asleep. The next day. After having breakfast at the hotel, Charles was sitting leisurely in the lobby. His secretary, Ms. Ginny, had been sent to his office. At this moment, as Charles was sitting in the lobby, he saw a man with a suitcase making his way to the hotel front desk to check in. His steps were steady, but his expression was grave. An aura of danger surrounded him, clearly, he had taken the lives of many the previous night. He seemed like a volcano about to erupt at any moment. Hey! John! Charles extended a hand to greet him. He had met John more than once. Thanks to his psychic dog, they had crossed paths several times while walking their dogs. They had exchanged contact information, and they could be considered acquaintances. Furthermore, when John received his dog from his loved one, he had called him to ask about some tips on raising a dog. They were, to a certain extent, dog-loving friends. Especially now, when John saw Charles greeting him in the hotel lobby, he was momentarily taken aback. He hadn't expected Charles to be a killer from the Continental Hotel. It should be noted that, after his loved one left the world of assassins, he had left that life behind for four years. This meant he had almost lost touch with everyone from the Continental Hotel, and he wasn't quite sure about Charles's exact profession. After a brief pause, he replied slowly, Charles, I'm here to check in at the hotel. Charles walked up to John Wick and stopped about a meter away from him. Then he said slowly, it seems like you've run into trouble. Someone has put a two million dollar bounty on you. Do you need help? All you need is a contract batch. He knew that although this situation had caused some trouble for John Wick, he could easily help out and obtain a contract badge essentially for free, it would be a profitable deal for him. Upon hearing that he now had a $2 million bounty on his head, John Wick didn't pay much attention. After all, he had realized last night, when he had dealt with the assassins who had come for him, that they wouldn't just give up. They would definitely offer a reward for his elimination. So, he calmly responded, not needed for now. If there's a need, I'll contact you. All right then, we'll be in touch. Upon hearing John Wick's refusal, Charles didn't mind. John Wick had plenty of troubles, and things weren't always smooth for him. There would always be times when he needed help. Besides, Charles could also intervene and help out voluntarily when things seemed dangerous, creating a sense of indebtedness. Seeing Charles walk away, John Wick continued toward the hotel front desk. At this moment, a female assassin who had just finished checking in turned to John Wick and said, Nice to see you again, John. I feel the same way, Perkins. After exchanging greetings, John completed his check-in procedures and then left the hotel lobby. Meanwhile, Charles continued to sit in the hotel lobby, slowly sipping his coffee. The grand show was about to begin tonight. Night fell. In the underground bar of the Continental Hotel, Charles was now sitting in a booth not far from the entrance with Ginny, enjoying some bourbon whiskey. Charles, the bounty on John Wick has gone up to four million dollars, and four gold coins. Are you sure you're not considering it? Ginny whispered the latest information she had in Charles's ear. Charles raised his index finger and shook it, indicating that he wasn't considering the mission. He then explained, I have a better plan. He held a positive view of this guy named John Wick. Although he was merely an ordinary person, his strength was impressive, earning him the nickname Night Devil due to his decisiveness in taking lives. If he could get him to help and join his side, it would be a significant boost to his early endeavors. After all, while his three ninjas had decent strength, he was still short on manpower. He sometimes found himself constrained when trying to accomplish certain tasks. While the two were conversing, the bar's entrance swung open, and John Wick entered. Seeing him, Charles greeted him once again. His voice reached John's ears. Hey! John! Upon hearing Charles's voice, John saw the two individuals not far from the entrance and then scanned the bar, spotting Winston in a booth. Subsequently, John walked up to Charles and greeted, Good evening, Charles. Facing the approaching John, Charles said, John, your price has doubled now four million plus four gold coins. Are you sure you don't need my help? Some of the newcomers nowadays aren't playing by the rules. Hearing Charles's words, John Wick's brow slightly furrowed. As a killer, offering to help someone typically meant that the other party needed his specific skills. He had already left the world of assassins behind, 
and this time it seemed to be a personal matter rather than professional. He didn't want to get dragged back into this quagmire. However, his bounty had doubled and now included four gold coins. This made John realize that the situation wasn't as simple as he had thought. Other assassins might try to cash in on the reward. But considering his own abilities, he believed he could handle the situation and graciously declined Charles's offer, expressing that he could manage for the time being. After that, John Wick left Charles's side and headed straight toward the booth where Winston was seated. He had some matters to discuss with Winston, and he also needed to find out more about those troublemakers and their current whereabouts. Chapter 4 Repeated Rejections Ginny watched as John Wick walked away and said with a playful tone, So, that's the Night Devil? It seems he declined our esteemed ninja's offer. And it looks like this legendary assassin got a beating as well. With a slight smile, Charles Doyle responded, He's been out of the assassin world for four years. Getting ambushed and sustaining some injuries is quite normal. At this point, he just wants to keep his distance from us. But you know, his return to the spotlight has caused quite a stir. He might not be able to completely sever ties with the assassin world. This incident might drag him back completely. And nobody can refuse Charles Doyle's goodwill, not even the Night Devil. As they conversed, John Wick had already finished talking with Winston and obtained the addresses of a few troublemakers. He left the bar shortly after. Seeing John leave, Ginny smiled and asked, He's gone. Do you want to follow him? Charles shook his head and replied calmly, No need. He'll be back at the hotel. The story is just beginning, and there will be plenty of opportunities. After a couple of drinks, Charles suggested, Let me walk you back. The nights in New York aren't exactly peaceful. They left the Continental Hotel and returned Ginny to her residence. After seeing her safely inside, Charles turned back towards the hotel. Back in her room, Ginny leaned against the door. Once she was sure Charles had left, she slowly stood up. She had known Charles for some time now, and had been his assistant for about half a year. She used to be a heat woman for a textile factory, but her life almost ended due to a botched mission. It was during that mission that she stumbled upon Charles's doorstep, and he had saved her. Since then, she had turned her back on her violent past. Upon learning that Charles was also an assassin, she chose to become his assistant. She helped him gather information on missions and handle miscellaneous tasks. During these six months, they didn't contact her after she left the textile factory. It was as if they silently accepted her departure. But today, she received news from the factory, the cross had betrayed them. Now she was torn between whether or not to trouble Charles with this matter. T slash N, I am not familiar with her story. So, if there is any issue with the translation, do let me know. On the other hand, back at the Continental Hotel, Charles quietly waited. His room was at the end of the hallway, right next to John Wick's room. Time ticked by slowly. Then he heard the sound of a door opening. Charles knew that John Wick had returned. As he anticipated, not long after, sounds of a scuffle emanated from the adjacent room. Although Charles didn't go over, he could well imagine what was happening. John Wick had likely apprehended Perkins, the female heatwoman who had violated the rules of the Continental Hotel. With a bedsheet over her head, John was likely giving her a lesson, hammering down blows. Charles knew that someone would notify the hotel reception, so he didn't bother calling them himself. Contemplating the hotel's strict rules, Charles couldn't help but find them slightly absurd. No killing allowed. While the rule made sense, the situation was quite ironic. Due to the rule, even after someone initiated a fight, you couldn't kill them on the hotel premises. After all, when one party violates the rules, you still need to follow them, otherwise, you could be seen as a rule breaker and face the Continental Hotel's consequences. This was why John Wick held back. In a matter of moments, the sounds of the scuffle ceased. John had emerged victorious. At this point, Charles Doyle opened his door room and saw Perkins crawling in the hallway. He shook his head silently. John, after ending the call, emerged from his room. He grabbed Perkins from behind, pressing the barrel of his gun against her head. He then knocked her out with the butt of his gun. Just as he did, Harry, staying in a room adjacent to John's, heard the commotion and opened his door with a gun in hand. The sound of a gun being loaded caught John's attention. He paused, uncertain whether the person behind him was an enemy, someone aiming to claim the bounty on him. Without turning around, a voice from behind him said, Do we know each other? Hearing the familiar voice, 
John Wick replied, We should, right. John then raised his hands, signaling that he meant no harm. Just as he was about to lift his head to turn around, he noticed that the door in front of him was also ajar, revealing a man standing there. It was Charles Doyle, whom he had encountered twice within the same day. After a brief pause, he turned away, greeted the black hitman behind him, Hey, Harry. Harry glanced at the three individuals, especially focusing on Charles Doyle. His pupils involuntarily contracted. Then he addressed John, Is everything all right? John Wick replied, No issues. Then you've got this covered. Harry turned to leave, heading back to his room. However, John called out to him, Hey, Harry. Want to earn a coin? Keep an eye on this sleeping beauty for me. With an expressionless face, Harry asked, Catch and release. John Wick humorously responded, Exactly, a game of cat and mouse. Hearing John's words, Harry accepted the task. He took out a pair of handcuffs from his room and secured Perkins' hands behind her back before leading her into his own room. Standing in the doorway, Charles Doyle held a bottle of Chivas Regal and an empty glass. He smiled at John Wick, who had momentarily finished his task, and said, John, care for a sip? Your injuries don't look light. As he spoke, Charles used the hand holding the glass to gesture towards John's injured abdomen. John Wick walked over, took the Chivas Regal and the glass, poured himself a drink, and downed it in one go. This is good whiskey. He glanced at the label Chivas Regal 1987 before returning the bottle and glass to Charles Doyle. Accepting the bottle and glass, Charles Doyle asked, John, you are looking a bit rough. Do you need assistance with your upcoming actions? Charles Doyle, I've retired. This is a personal matter, and I can handle it. John Wick clearly didn't want to be dragged back into the quagmire of the assassin world and declined the help of this persistent friend. Charles Doyle shrugged and expressed his regret, All right then. John. Take care of yourself. If the Night Devil were to fall now, it would be a loss for the assassin world. Afterwards, Charles Doyle turned and returned to his room, closing the door behind him. As for Harry, the black hitman responsible for guarding Perkins, Charles had no intention of reminding him about the potential danger he might face. Whether he lives or dies, doesn't concern him. Chapter 05, The Villain Dies From Talking Too Much Back in his room, Charles Doyle wasn't upset about John Wick's refusal again. If you want someone to owe you a favor, especially someone like John Wick, it can't be accomplished through such straightforward means. He was merely trying to deepen John Wick's impression of him and avoid triggering too much caution from sudden assistance. After all, John Wick was about to face a major crisis, being ambushed at the church by Vigo Tarasov's men, getting knocked out and captured, nearly suffocating with a plastic bag. Charles Doyle wanted to rescue John before Marcus could, as one life-saving act was enough, he couldn't allow Marcus to monopolize two opportunities. After a brief rest, Charles left the Continental Hotel and headed towards the church in Little Russia. He knew that as dawn approached, John Wick would be arriving at the scene. Upon arriving at the location, Charles scoped out the surroundings of the church and identified a suspicious-looking warehouse that likely held John Wick captive. He chose a rooftop with good visibility and ample cover to wait. Daylight came. Gunshots rang out from the church, alerting Charles Doyle who was concealed in the shadows. The sound of gunfire signaled that the nightcrawler had commenced his killing spree. Charles retrieved a pair of binoculars and began observing the deadly performance. Pop, pop, pop. A series of shots, each one lethal. The whole process flowed like water, devoid of unnecessary words or actions. This distinctive charm of straightforwardness in John Wick's method appealed to Charles. He had plans to recruit him under his wing for handling regular tasks. Such a killer, in all honesty, didn't seem weaker than the so-called Hawkeye. In the early stages, he could be a valuable asset. As Charles marveled at John Wick's actions, the battle concluded. Two women emerged from the church, followed shortly by smoke rising from the basement. Charles knew that John Wick had incinerated the cash, antiques, artworks, and evidence of collusion with government officials that Vigo Tarasov had stored in the basement. Charles clicked his tongue, lamenting, it's a shame to see all that money go up in smoke. They could have been turned into copper coins for me. What a waste. Soon, he spotted John Wick emerging from the church and quickly positioned himself for a clear line of sight. Damn it, everything's turned to ashes, Vigo cursed as he stormed out of the basement, executing the priest who had opened the door to the underground vault with a gunshot to the head. At this moment, 
John Wick, who had witnessed this scene from the rooftop, didn't hesitate. Holding a hairy RCA-415 assault rifle, he headed straight towards the lower levels. Bang, bang. The sound of an assault rifle echoed, and Vigo turned his head to find one of his henchmen collapsing, shot. He realized that John Wick had arrived. In an instant, he crouched, taking cover by the side of the car. Damn it, counterattack. His henchmen immediately drew their guns and engaged in an exchange of fire with John Wick. Unfortunately, Vigo's men failed to inflict any substantial damage on John Wick. Instead, they fell victim to his lethal accuracy. From the rooftop, Charles Doyle watched the gunfight below with relish, murmuring to himself, these gangsters can't compare to professional assassins, especially legendary killers like John Wick. Their marksmanship is utterly pathetic, as if their child facing an adult. By the way, John used to be one of Vigo's henchmen, right? Tisk, tisk, tisk. In the end, the Vigo's gang will be wiped out by his own men. Truly a guy who was screwed over by his own son. Three down, five down, beautifully done, that's six. In the blink of an eye, John Wick had taken down six foes. Charles was keeping count from above. After swiftly reloading, John killed two more, bringing the tally to eight Russian gang members eliminated. One of Vigo's henchmen climbed into a car and started the engine, preparing to ram John Wick. Charles Doyle, who had witnessed this, had no intention of lending assistance. He was still waiting for his opportunity. Bang! The sound of a collision reverberated, and in the next moment, John Wick was sent flying, losing consciousness. As the gunshot ceased, Vigo and his men approached, binding John Wick and preparing to take him to a warehouse for interrogation. Observing this, Charles felt a tinge of exasperation. While the outcome aligned well with his intentions, he reminded himself that, when facing an enemy, it was best to not prattle on and instead just kill them. Indeed, if Vigo had shot John just now, how could there be any further events? His son wouldn't die, and neither would he. Sure enough, villains die from talking too much. Quietly, Charles followed behind Vigo's group, stealthily sneaking without making a sound. Utilizing his speed, he entered the warehouse along with them. In the warehouse, Vigo Tarasov instructed his henchmen to tie John Wick to a chair. As John slowly regained consciousness, Vigo began, John, let me put it this way. My men will definitely dismember you. At this moment, one of Vigo's men placed a chair across from John. Vigo sat down, launching a lengthy monologue. Hidden in the shadowy corner of the warehouse, Charles's lips curled into a wry smile. Such situations left him somewhat speechless. When Vigo finally concluded his speech and prepared to leave with his henchmen, seeing John Wick on the verge of being suffocated by a plastic bag, Charles intervened first. He swiftly launched two shurikens. Swoosh, swoosh. The shurikens soared through the air with a whooshing sound, instantly killing the two henchmen. The two thugs clutched their throats, unable to make a sound. They collapsed to the ground, twitched briefly, and then blood gushed from their necks. They died in an instant. At this moment, outside the warehouse, Marcus, who was ready to provide backup, seeing the two shurikens taking down the gang members, he knew he didn't need to intervene. Afterward, he merely observed the situation inside through the scope of his sniper rifle, waiting to confirm the final outcome. Charles emerged from the shadows, greeting with a hey, John. I told you that you needed my help. Chapter 06, The Continental Hotel and the High Table T slash N, there was a slight mistake in the last chapter. Vigo already left the room when Charles saved John Wick. John Wick was surprised by the sudden appearance of Charles Doyle, who had saved him. Just moments ago, he had thought he might be joining his beloved wife and dog on the other side. He thanked Charles, saying, Thank you. I owe you a favor. As John was about to attempt to untie the restraints on his hands, Charles spoke up, No need for that trouble. He swiftly threw a dart that neatly cut the restraints on John's wrists. Pretty cool. John said, and without lingering, he picked up a shotgun from the ground, saying as he ran, Charles, I'll thank you later at the Continental Hotel. Right now, I've got things to do. With that, he charged out of the storage room. The sunlight illuminated Charles Doyle, who took out a shuriken. He waved it in a particular direction under the sunlight causing the reflected light to shine onto the rooftop where Marcus was stationed. Marcus realized he had been spotted. As a seasoned assassin with a title of his own, he didn't make any unnecessary moves. 
he had come to assist John Wick, and now that his old friend had escaped danger on his own, Marcus was satisfied. Putting away his sniper rifle, Marcus prepared to leave the scene of conflict. Meanwhile, outside, John Wick had confronted Vigo and even used the shotgun to take out Vigo's driver in a single shot. Where is he, Vigo? John aimed his shotgun at Vigo after taking out a henchman beside him. After questioning Vigo about his son's whereabouts and arranging a deal to cancel the bounty against him, John agreed not to harm Vigo. While John was dealing with Vigo, Charles Doyle, who had left the warehouse, didn't reveal himself. Utilizing his ninja-like speed and stealth, he silently left the scene without exposing his presence. Charles didn't concern himself with the reconciliation between John and Vigo. He had his own perspective. He believes that everyone has their own principles. At the same time, inside the Continental Hotel, after Perkins killed Harry in the hotel room, she took the gold coin that John had given to Harry and remembered the moment when John unexpectedly rolled off the bed during her failed assassination attempt. She re-entered John Wick's room and found a bullet hole on the head of the bed. Upon closer examination, she realized it was caused by a sniper bullet, not the handgun she had used. Following the trajectory of the bullet, she looked toward the window and spotted a bullet hole. Ruined my job. I'll make you pay. Perkins instantly understood why her assassination attempt had failed. After taking note of everything, she left the Continental Hotel. Meanwhile, in another location, having left Little Russia, Charles Doyle quickly returned to the entrance of the Continental Hotel. He handed a gold coin to the doorman, covering the entrance fee. He then returned to his hotel room to await John's arrival and receive his gratitude. Charles Doyle was quite satisfied with the successful completion of this mission. Having killed just two gang members, he managed to save John's life and secure a promise in return. It was a trade that seemed worthwhile. Thinking about the gold coins he had used so far, Charles couldn't help but feel a bit bewildered. These coins were issued and promoted by the high table, and their purchasing power was simply astonishing. To elaborate. Entry to the Continental Hotel, one gold coin. Staying at the Continental Hotel, one gold coin. Entry to the hotel bar, one gold coin. Arranging medical treatment, one gold coin. Disposing of a body, one gold coin. Even a simple favor, like the one John asked of Harry, cost one gold coin. Any service within the Continental Hotel, including hiring an assassin, had a minimum price of one gold coin. To put it simply, one gold coin could only get you an entry into the hotel and a few hours of care. On the other hand, the same gold coin could hire a reasonably capable assassin for an assassination mission. Consider that John Wick, also known as the Boogeyman, had a bounty of just four gold coins on his head. And for four gold coins, assassins in the Continental Hotel were willing to break the rules and commit murder. Without gold coins, with only regular currency, you might not be able to hire a Continental Hotel assassin. These gold coins had an enigmatic purchasing power, with their value fluctuating significantly. However, thanks to the promotion by the high table, these coins became the hard currency of the assassin world. Supporting the value of these gold coins was the Continental Hotel, which seemed to be the equivalent of a mercenary guild in the assassin world. It issued bounties, gathered intelligence, and most importantly, becoming a registered member of the Continental Hotel offered protection, including a prohibition on fighting within the hotel's premises. Around 80% of New York's assassins registered as members of the Continental Hotel. The hotel was a hub for assassins. Of course, there were still various other assassin organizations in the outside world, but none of them could match the power of the Continental Hotel. The hotel also had its own enforcers, responsible for punishing assassins who violated its rules. Each Continental Hotel manager has their own armed force. Behind the Continental Hotel stood another organization the High Table. The High Table was an alliance of major criminal syndicates from around the world, comprising 12 seats in total. Its headquarter is located in the desert near Casablanca. These 12 seats constituted the management of the high table, each occupied by a different faction such as the Camorra, the Italian Mafia, the Triads, and more. However, wherever there are people, there will be conflicts. Even with the major criminal syndicates forming the high table, internal power struggles and conflicts persisted. Charles Doyle had a particular goal in mind to obtain one of the 12 seats in the high table. After all, before the Marvel Universe event began, this seemed like a worthwhile objective. After all, this business was right up his alley. Ninjas are responsible for assassination, gathering intelligence, and even starting wars, aren't they? Lying on his bed, 
Charles Doyle absent-mindedly picked up a gold coin and toyed with it in his hand, causing the coin to dance between his fingers. On the other side, after providing John Wick with the information he needed, Vigo Tarasov didn't immediately leave in his car. Instead, he returned to the warehouse where he had previously held John captive. He looked at the two corpses on the ground and walked over to inspect them. He wanted to understand how the Night Devil, who was clearly bound and outnumbered, managed to escape and turn the tables. After all, his men were armed with firearms, while John was tightly bound. Examining the wounds on the bodies of his henchmen and the two shurikens and a throwing dart left behind on the ground, Vigo Tarasov's face darkened. He roared in anger, Ninja, Charles. Chapter 07, Vigo Tarasov's Retaliation Vigo Tarasov was extremely furious at this point. He knew who had disrupted his plans and saved John Wick. He roared in anger, no one can disrupt my plans like this and get away with it. Having said that, Vigo didn't linger any longer. He left the warehouse and drove straight back home. His face was as dark as a storm cloud. Ever since his troublesome son had crossed paths with the Night Devil, nothing had gone smoothly for him. Important information had been destroyed, his henchmen were being killed off, and he was even forced to compromise and reveal his son's hiding place to save his own skin. While he had taken measures to protect his son at that location, Vigo still lacked confidence. He hoped against hope that his men could keep his son safe and eliminate John who had come for them. Though the odds were slim, Vigo clung to a one in a million chance and waited for the outcome. Time ticked away. Vigo's expression grew increasingly serious. He smoked, leaving a pile of cigarette butts in the ashtray. He was waiting for the news that was tormenting him. The phone rang, and Vigo took a deep breath before answering it. After hearing the news on the other end, he paused for a moment before hanging up the phone. He then picked up the cigarette, taking several long drags. Following that, he dialed several phone numbers, making arrangements. Meanwhile, after avenging himself, John Wick returned to the Continental Hotel. As he walked into the hotel, the front desk attendant, Karen, called out to him. Mr. Wick. Hearing his name, John stopped and approached the front desk. Karen handed him a set of car keys and said, Mr. Wick, the Continental Hotel deeply apologizes for the events of last night. This is a gesture of goodwill from the hotel management in response to what happened. After hearing Karen's words, John Wick looked at the car keys, not refusing them but accepting them. He greeted Karen and then proceeded upstairs. Arriving at Charles's room, John lightly knocked on the door. Hearing the knock, Charles opened the door and greeted him, John, is everything taken care of? Yes, it's done. Then come in. With that, Charles invited John inside to sit down and chat. John entered the room and said, Charles, thank you for your help. You saved my life this time. After speaking, John retrieved a blood oath medallion from his pocket and continued, you mentioned earlier that you wanted one of my blood oath medallions. I'm curious about what you need me to do. If it's something that can be done soon, I won't give you a blood oath medallion. I'll just help you accomplish the task. After all, you know I've retired and been out of the assassin world for four years. Charles's expression remained calm as he said slowly, Give me the blood oath medallion. I'll contact you when I need your help. There's nothing else for you to do right now. Upon hearing this, John's face remained impassive, but internally he felt a sense of gravity. Whatever Charles had planned for later might not be an easy task, yet he handed over the blood oath medallion as requested. Receiving the blood oath medallion, Charles smiled. He was in good spirits and was ready to give some reminder to John Wick. He opened his mouth and said, John, did you kill Vigo? John Wick wasn't sure why Charles was asking about this, but he replied, I only had some personal grievances with Vigo's son. I didn't lay a hand on Vigo. He told me about his son's whereabouts and cancelled the bounty. Upon realizing that John had spared Vigo's life, Charles continued, Vigo Tarasov is the leader of the Russian Mafia. He won't take this lying down. Be prepared for his retaliation. I believe Vigo Tarasov will honor the agreement between us. Nonetheless, thank you for the warning. Hearing that John Wick didn't heed his warning, Charles didn't say more. As for whether Marcus would survive, that was up to fate. After bidding farewell to Charles, John Wick checked out of the Continental Hotel. Before leaving, he submitted the blood oath medallion he had handed over to the hotel's registration. Driving the black dodge provided by the Continental Hotel's management, John Wick was on his way to meet an old friend. After all, 
it wasn't just Charles who saved his life, but also Marcus, who had warned him at the hotel. Arriving at their usual meeting spot, Marcus joked, John, how many times do I have to save you? John Wick responded, I'm extremely grateful, Marcus. Marcus glanced at the man before him and then said, You don't look too good. I've retired. This is my retired state. Hearing his longtime partner's reply, Marcus was somewhat dissatisfied. He said, Retired? You believe that? You just have a new life. You'll find a way to get back on track. With that, Marcus patted John Wick's shoulder and said, It's time to go home. After sighing, Marcus turned and left. Their conversation wasn't particularly pleasant. However, neither Marcus nor John Wick knew that their meeting had been fully recorded by Perkins, who was hidden in a nearby car. Perkins then reported the conversation to Vigo Tarasov. Back in his room, Vigo Tarasov watched the video brought by Perkins. His expression grew even darker. He hadn't anticipated that besides the intervention of the ninja, Charles, even the assassin he had hired, Marcus, had betrayed him. Sometimes, the anger of others meddling in your affairs pales in comparison to the betrayal of your own underlings. If it weren't for Marcus's betrayal, his son wouldn't have died. This realization fueled Vigo's anger even more. Without hesitation, Vigo issued orders to his men to surround Marcus's home. He wanted Marcus to pay the price for his actions. At the same time, he took out his phone and instructed another contact, get rid of that damn Charles. The ninja. I want him dead. After issuing orders to his men, Vigo, accompanied by Perkins and some of his henchmen, drove to Marcus's home. He intended to take care of him there, using methods befitting for the Russian mafia, dealing with the assassin who had betrayed him. Chapter 08, Ambush Inside the Continental Hotel, Charles entered the Naruto World interface and completed today's sign-in, receiving a reward of 30,000 copper coins. Upgrade to a privileged Tier 2 user and enjoy double sign-in rewards. Looking at the reappearing invitation to recharge, Charles couldn't help but feel a bit helpless. It's not that he didn't want to become a premium user, but he genuinely didn't know how to recharge, so he reluctantly chose to close the pop-up. Having obtained John Wick's Blood Oath medallion, Charles went to the Continental Hotel's front desk, checked out, and left the hotel. As the sky darkened, Charles didn't head to his office. Domino Irica was in charge there, so he didn't need to worry for now. If there were any difficult tasks, Irica would contact him. Although Irica was just a mid-level ninja responsible for teaching within the Naruto universe, in the time before the Marvel event started, taking on missions was still quite easy for him. Charles drove his beloved Mercedes 300 SL to 405 Lexington Avenue in Manhattan, New York. He had rented a 200-square-meter apartment in the Chrysler Building for his usual residence. In reality, Charles had once searched for the Stark Tower on Fifth Avenue. He wanted to see if those several individuals from the Marvel world were present. However, the result was that there was no apartment called the Stark Tower on Fifth Avenue yet, and thus, those individuals didn't exist either. Frankly, this left him slightly disappointed. Before it got completely dark, Charles arrived at Lexington Avenue. He slowly drove his car into the underground parking garage of the Chrysler building. At this moment, the security personnel responsible for the building's underground parking saw Charles's car from afar. They immediately opened the gate and greeted him with a smile. Mainly because Charles's Mercedes 300 SL was quite distinctive, being a 1954 model with gullwing doors. It was highly recognizable. Moreover, among all the building's residents, only Charles was willing to drive such a valuable vintage car on the road. Yes, the 1954 Mercedes 300 SL was truly an authentic vintage car. Charles had bought this car from a bankrupt wealthy man. At the time, the car had only been driven for a little over 2,000 kilometers, and it had been very well maintained by the owner. It was in perfect condition for road travel. In Charles's eyes, cars were meant to be driven, not left in a garage as exhibits. It wasn't his original intention. He passed through the entrance gate, slowly driving into the underground parking garage, and parked his car in his designated spot. As he got out of the car, he felt a surge of killing intent. Gunshots rang out, and in the blink of an eye, Charles retrieved a shuriken from the Naruto world and deflected the bullets coming his way. Clang! A crisp collision sound echoed as Charles deflected the bullets. In the next instant, he threw a shuriken, which landed directly on the neck of the person firing the gun, instantly killing them. However, when he fell to the ground, 
his finger remained on the trigger due to the rapid fire, causing the assault rifle to spray bullets toward Charles's nearby car. Bastard! Charles cursed under his breath. He didn't pause his movements, even though he lacked any weapon in his hand. He deflected all the incoming bullets, finally saving his car from any damage. All of this happened within the blink of an eye. Having just saved his car and barely had a moment to catch his breath, another gunman appeared, aiming at Charles and pulling the trigger vigorously. A massive barrage of bullets was unleashed, forming a rain of projectiles. Fortunately, the moment Charles saw the gunman, he swiftly performed hand signs and employed the substitution jutsu in time, evading the barrage of bullets. However, his beloved car behind him was instantly turned into a riddle. The four gunmen, upon witnessing Charles transform into a wooden pole in an instant, were left dumbfounded. They even stopped pulling the triggers, completely astonished. At this moment, Charles appeared to the side through the substitution jutsu. He swiftly turned his body. Whoosh! He arrived in front of one of the gunmen. The shuriken swept across the man's neck, and in an instant, one gunman met his demise, collapsing to the ground. Now, the other three gunmen had just managed to react and immediately redirected their guns. Unfortunately, before the three could even turn around, Charles's figure was like a ghostly phantom. He appeared before them in an instant and used the shuriken to slash their necks. With all five gunmen dead, the underground parking garage fell silent once more. No more gunmen jumped out. Charles walked over to his car, gazing at the dense bullet marks on its body, instantly feeling heartache. This was an antique car that he really liked. He wasn't sure if it could be repaired back to its original state. Turning his focus from the battle-damaged version of his Mercedes 300SL, Charles was curious who the audacious individual was that dared to attack him. Charles approached the bodies of the gunmen and discovered that they were all Russians. He immediately deduced that this was all the work of that bastard, Vigo. Damn Vigo! In the morning's battle, he hadn't retrieved his shurikens. Instead, he left them at the scene as a symbol, to let Vigo know that he, the ninja Charles, had saved those people. Originally, he wanted to intimidate Vigo, but things didn't go as planned. Instead, it led to Vigo sending his underlings to find him. Knowing who the target was, the rest was easier to handle. Charles took out his phone, dialed a number, and soon the call was answered. Charlie, Chrysler Building Parking Garage, a dinner for five. Yes, right away. After hanging up the call, his phone rang shortly after. Charles glanced at the incoming number and pressed the answer button. Charles, is that you? John, it's me. On the other end of the line, John Wick's tone carried a touch of sadness. He spoke with an urgent tone, I should have taken care of Vigo. That bastard sent people to kill my old friend Marcus. He saved me at the Continental Hotel yesterday. Charles, Vigo might come after you too. Be careful. Charles looked at the five corpses on the ground and said, he already did. Hey. I've already dealt with Vigo's men he sent after me. Hearing that Charles had already taken care of Vigo's men, John Wick said, as long as you're safe. I'm going after Vigo now to settle the score. We'll be in touch later. With that, John Wick hung up the phone. Hearing the busy tone on the other end of the call, Charles chuckled and muttered, stubborn old man. Charles knew that John was going to avenge his old friend. Glancing at his beloved car once again, he muttered, since someone wants to kill you, I won't compete for that, but this debt will be settled with your Russian gang. Chapter 09, Gang's Lair Charles Doyle, with his mobile phone, dialed Ginny's number and made a call. In less than three seconds, the call was answered. Ginny, help me find the address of Vigo Tarasov's gang in New York and send it to me as soon as possible. Ginny didn't ask for the reason, simply replying, understood. After giving a simple task, Charles Doyle hung up the phone. He knew that the church was just a base for the Russian gang, and the main headquarters of the gang wasn't there. The items in the church were only a part of the Russian gang's operations. His main focus was on the incriminating evidence and bribery materials related to officials. Charles Doyle waited in the underground parking lot. Not too long afterward, a van drove into the parking lot. Charlie got out of the van and approached Charles, taking off his hat and greeting, It's an honor to serve you. Mr. Doyle. I leave this place to you, Charlie. Charles Doyle took out five gold coins from his pocket and placed them in Charlie's hand. Taking the coins, Charlie, along with his team, quickly cleaned up the scene. Meanwhile, 
a text message from Ginny arrived. Charles looked at the address it was a rundown factory located in the outskirts of Brooklyn. He glanced at his damaged car taking a deep breath. It was a true vintage car, and he felt heartache over its condition. They ambushed me and managed to wreck my car. Damn! Exhaling a breath of frustration, Charles ultimately left the underground parking lot. Exiting the parking lot, he noticed that the security guards at the entrance was nowhere to be seen. Likely, upon hearing the gunfire, they had decided to make a run for it. He stopped a taxi on the street and provided the address to the driver, then closed his eyes to rest during the journey. Without hyration or heavenly transfer technique, although Charles Doyle believed his speed was not slower than that of the city cars, running to the destination might just prompt Phil Carlson from SHIELD to pay him a visit the next day. On the other side, John Wick had already arrived outside his friend's home. He exited the car, pulled out his handgun, and cautiously entered the building. By this time, Vigo and his men had already left. The room only contained Marcus, who had been shot multiple times and lay in a pool of blood. John Wick's expression turned heavy as he sat down beside his friend's body, silent. After a moment, his phone rang. John Wick answered the call, and Winston's voice came through. John, I know you are looking for information about Vigo from me. But the Continental Hotel has its rules, so I won't tell you. There's a helicopter waiting for someone at a certain helipad, fully fueled. Hearing Winston's words, John Wick immediately understood it was a clue. He hung up the phone directly. Looking at Marcus lying nearby, John Wick was determined to avenge his friend. He stood up, left Marcus's house, got into his car, and headed for the specified helipad. By now, New York City had entered the night, the sky completely dark, and the city sparkled even more brightly due to the neon lights. On the other hand, as soon as Charles Doyle got out of the taxi, he saw the taxi speeding away faster than when it had arrived. It seemed that the taxi driver was aware that this wasn't a safe area. At this point, the arrival of the taxi had alerted the guards near the factory. During these few days, the Russian gang led by Vigo had become extremely cautious. While they heard that the old man had reconciled with the night devil, they were worried about other gangs attacking, or seizing their territory and business. After all, Vigo was just a gang leader, not an army. With their numbers, losing too many of their own would naturally weaken their strength. Especially since John Wick had killed a significant number of their brothers, nearly 70 of them. As a result, the guards' strength around the factory had clearly weakened. Only two guards remained outside. A beam of light shone towards Charles Doyle. Who are you? In front of Charles Doyle appeared a burly man, clearly carrying concealed firearms on his body. He held a flashlight and aimed its beam at Charles Doyle's face, as if wanting to see who he was. Charles Doyle didn't reply. With a swift movement, he appeared in front of the man, clamped his hand over the man's mouth, preventing him from making a sound, and his other hands shook and lightly swept across the man's neck, quickly dispatching him. At this point, Charles Doyle murmured, These scumbags from society need to be cleansed. It seems I need to play the role of a cleaner. The next moment, Charles formed hand seals with both hands and cast the transformation jutsu, taking the appearance of the guard. He reached out and removed the walkie-talkie and earpiece from the guard's body, putting them on himself. As for the guard's body, Charles Doyle discreetly hid it in a dark corner. Because of the darkness of the night, the other guard didn't notice anything unusual. In this manner, Charles Doyle returned nonchalantly. Seeing his companion returning, the other guard spoke up, Bob, everything all right? With a smile on his face, Charles Doyle replied, No problem. Just someone who got off at the wrong stop. I sent him away. At this moment, the guard was about to speak, but suddenly, Charles made a move. His shuriken pierced through the guard's neck, while his hand covered the guard's mouth as he said, Don't talk. Take a deep breath. Yes, deep breath. After pausing for about three heartbeats and confirming the guard's death, Charles Doyle propped the guard's body against the wall and lightly opened the factory's door before walking in. In this way, Charles Doyle openly infiltrated the Russian gang's lair. Inside the factory, a burly Russian man was holding a bottle of vodka, pouring it into his mouth. His speech was slurred as he mumbled, Aiden, an assassin killed so many of us, and the boss actually made amends. Damn it, we're the Russian gang. Throw money at him, what's there to be afraid of? Offer him four million. If it doesn't work, raise it to 8 million. If necessary, make it 10 million. He's just a small night devil, 
can he really change the game? At this point, the person transformed as Aiden spoke up, Wes, you're drunk. Stepping forward, he took the vodka bottle from Wes's hand. Boss must have his reasons for doing this. Let's keep a low profile for a while and not give other gangs the chance to strike at us. Hearing Aiden's words, Wes grew more frustrated. He snatched back the vodka, took a gulp, and suddenly noticed Charles Doyle entering. He grumbled, Bob, instead of properly guarding outside, you came in here to slack off. Didn't Aiden tell you to be vigilant during this time? Chapter 10, Slaughter Charles Doyle didn't pay attention to Wes's yelling but quickly assessed the entire factory. The factory wasn't small, with three levels, two above ground and one below. There were several cars parked on the first floor along with some tables and sofas. There were twelve individuals on the first floor, armed with guns, scattered around the place. Four of them were guarding the entrance to the basement level. Seeing four guards at the entrance to the basement level, Charles secretly guessed whether the first floor was where the vault was located. At this point, when Bob ignored him and didn't leave, but instead was looking around, Wes became instantly furious. He walked up to Charles and shouted, Bob, are you deaf? Did you not hear me tell you to get out and guard? As Wes tried to push Bob away, Charles, who had already gathered information about the factory, struck back. A shuriken was swiftly sent towards the Russian brute trying to push him, instantly piercing through his heart. Wes looked incredulously at the shuriken in his heart, pointing at Charles Doyle and stammering, You, you. Struggling to form a coherent sentence, Wes ultimately collapsed on the ground, dead. Aiden, who had been keeping an eye on Wes, was stunned. He immediately shouted, Bob has betrayed us, kill him. He drew his gun and was about to shoot. The other members also reacted upon Aiden's shout. At this moment, Charles Doyle, who had already gathered all the necessary information, slid a shuriken from his hand. Like flowers scattering from a beauty's hand, the shuriken were flung in all directions. The shuriken instantly struck the ground under a few of the gangster's feet. Initially, they sneered as they thought the shuriken hadn't hit them but instead the ground. However, the paper attached to the shuriken burst into flames. Boom. 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 The sounds of consecutive explosions rang out, instantly killing all the guards except those at the entrance to the basement level. Hearing the explosion downstairs, the gangsters on the second floor immediately realized what was happening. They shouted, We're under attack. They picked up their firearms and rushed downstairs to reinforce. Of the four guards at the entrance to the basement level, three were instantly killed by the exploding tags, and the remaining one was seriously injured. After alerting the members on the second floor through the intercom and telling them to be on high alert, he fainted. The smoke from the explosion still hung in the air, as the first two gang members who rushed down were cautious, holding their guns and searching for the enemy. Seeing a figure emerge from the smoke, one of the gang members shouted, There. Instantly, they both pulled the triggers, and bullets flew, forming a rain of gunfire directed at the figure emerging from the smoke. Bullets passed through the figure in the smoke but there was no scream or sensation of hitting flesh. It turned out that Charles Doyle had used Shadow Clone Jutsu to create an illusion, diverting their attention. In the next moment, several kunao were hurled toward the direction from which the gunshots came. Ah! Two screams sounded, and the two gang members who had just fired their guns fell dead on the spot. Hearing the cessation of gunfire and the screams, several gang members who had just grabbed their weapons and were rushing downstairs to provide backup had their expressions change. The initial haste with which they were charging downstairs transformed into caution as they slowed their steps, preparing to blindly shoot at the corner. At this moment, Charles Doyle sprinted forward and arrived at the stairwell on the second floor entrance. He crouched down, then with a burst of speed, cracked the cement floor beneath him. Like a bolt of lightning, he shot straight towards the second floor. The gang members who were preparing to provide support along the way suddenly found Shuriken cutting across their throats, ending their lives. Racing through the hail of bullets, Charles Doyle continued his rampage, claiming one life after another like the Grim Reaper. The gang members on the second floor were now in disarray. They were no longer forming an effective counterattack. Three of them even took the opportunity to smash the windows, yelling loudly as they jumped down. Apart from the three who jumped out of the window, all the gang members on the second floor had been killed by Charles Doyle's shuriken. And he emerged from the chaos unscathed. Arriving at the shattered window, Charles Doyle watched as three limping gang members tried to escape. 
he conjured three kunao in his hand and threw them towards the fleeing gang members. Swoosh! 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 The three kunao instantly lodged in the necks of the escaping gang members. In the next second, the three who hadn't even reached the road fell to the ground. Blood spurted from their necks, staining the ground beneath them with crimson color. Seeing all three of them dead, Charles Doyle nodded in satisfaction. Good, not a single one got away. Shaking off the blood stains on his shuriken, Charles Doyle descended from the second floor. He arrived at the entrance to the basement level that had previously been guarded by four members. As he entered, he noticed that one person wasn't entirely dead. He approached and gave the man a finishing blow, sending him to embrace death. Only then did he start to examine this entrance closely. He found that the entrance to the basement level was blocked by a massive vault door. It wasn't a regular wooden door or a residential security door. It was a sturdy steel door, at least 10 centimeters thick. He had wondered why reinforcements hadn't come from the basement level when they had come from the second floor. It turned out this door was meant to isolate the inside from the outside. Even the people outside needed permission to open it. Meanwhile, the six guards on the basement level were on edge. One of the gang members, holding an assault rifle, spoke up, Tana, there's no more movement outside. Could it be that the enemy has been dealt with? Tana, the man addressed, didn't answer him directly. Instead, he pressed a button on his belt and spoke into his earpiece, Sam, what's the situation outside? Has the crisis been resolved? Outside the vault door, Charles Doyle's ears twitched as he heard the voice coming through the earpiece of a body on the ground. He walked over, picked up the walkie-talkie and earpiece, and addressed the people inside, Sam is already dead. It's your turn soon. In the next moment, he crushed the walkie-talkie in his hand, and the remnants slipped from his fingers. Behind the vault door. At this point, everyone exchanged glances. The words transmitted through the walkie-talkie weren't just heard by Charles, all the guards heard them too. He can't get in. This vault door was customized by Vigo himself, based on bank vault doors. Without high explosives, it can't be opened at all. Hearing Tana's analysis, the other five people's nerves slightly relaxed. Tana spoke again, Maud, you quickly call Vigo and tell him to send reinforcements. Let him know his base is under attack. The man called Maud immediately snapped back to attention and rushed to the side. He picked up the phone on the table and started dialing. Chapter 11, Ceiling Formation On the other side. At this moment, Vigo was on his way to the airport when his phone started ringing. Seeing the caller ID, he realized it was a call from someone at the gang's headquarters. He immediately answered the call. Vigo, someone has breached our headquarters. Right now, only Tana and I are guarding the basement level. All the other brothers inside the factory have been killed. We need reinforcements. Hearing the words coming through the phone, Vigo's face stiffened, and he gritted his teeth, saying, Damn night demon. I'll immediately send more people to the headquarters for support. You six hold your ground. John probably didn't bring any weapons to break open the vault door. At this moment, the sky outside was filled with lightning and thunder, a storm was imminent. Clearly, Vigo didn't know who was behind the attack on their headquarters. But thinking back to the call he had made to John Wick earlier, although that call had allowed him to vent his frustration, it had also severely provoked the other party. While the person on the other end of the call hadn't revealed who had attacked them, Vigo believed that it was most likely John Wick's doing. Meanwhile, the convoy made a turn, and the airport was not far away. With the phone in his hand, Vigo was about to send support. But before he could dial the phone, he saw through the rearview mirror that a tail was following the convoy. It was John Wick, driving a black Dodge, catching up. Seeing this scene, Vigo's face grew even darker, cursing, you bastard. At this point, John Wick was driving the black Dodge given by the Continental Hotel. He raced like the wind, pressing the accelerator as if his life depended on it. Finally, he caught up with Vigo and the others just as they were about to reach the helicopter. Performing a slick drift and power slide, John Wick's Dodge raised a cloud of dust, and then with an acceleration, he finally caught sight of Vigo Tarasov's convoy. John Wick let out a long exhale, he had finally caught up. Meanwhile, Vigo Tarasov quickly dialed the number of his brother, Abram Tarasov. Sitting in the passenger seat, the gang's advisor, Avi, glanced at the car behind them and then urged the driver, Damn it, drive faster. The helicopter is just ahead, speed up, hurry. By this time, 
the call to Abram Tarasov had gone through. Vigo instructed, Abram, gather your men and head to our gang's outpost in Brooklyn immediately. There's an attack going on there, take more reinforcements. Boss, is it the night demon? Obviously, Abram was also aware of the situation. Due to their nephew's actions, his brother had clashed with John Wick. Vigo Tarasov glanced back at the driver in the pursuing Dodge and answered, It's not him, the night demon is on my side. Hearing his big brother Vigo say this, Abram breathed a sigh of relief internally and replied, You can rest assured, I'll make sure to reduce whoever came here causing trouble into pieces. After setting things straight, Vigo hung up the phone, then glanced at John Wick, who was closely following in the car behind, and finally closed his eyes in the car, taking a deep breath. In the outskirts of a factory in Brooklyn, Staring at the thick vault door in front of him, Charles Doyle lightly knocked on it and found that the door was a solid ten inches thick. He then took out explosive tags from his inventory space. Concerned that a single tag might not have enough power, he took out a total of ten. It wasn't that he was reluctant to use more, but he was considering the explosive resistance of this old factory. The last thing he wanted was to blow up the entire building along with the vault door. Primarily, he hadn't been able to recruit Naruto Uzumaki who had mastered the Ray's Nan. Otherwise, a Ray's Nan would have blown open any door. What a hassle this was. As for his Chidori, he didn't want to end up like Suzuki, whose hand got stuck in the door and then got sprayed with bullets. Remember, behind the door wasn't dead bodies, and if his hand got stuck, he'd be a target for gunfire. Not dwelling on these matters anymore, Charles Doyle started to use ceiling formation to attach the explosive tags to various corners of the vault door according to a specific sequence. Inside the vault door, a few individuals heard no noise and were guessing whether the other party had given up because they couldn't get past the door. The ceiling formation was a skill Charles Doyle had obtained from Irika Umino. It allowed him to connect multiple explosive tags using a barrier formation, creating a trap. The power of the skill was determined by the number of explosive tags used. After attaching all the explosive tags and setting up the ceiling formation, Charles Doyle walked out of the entrance stairwell and positioned himself against the wall to avoid being hit by debris from the explosion. Charles Doyle formed the tiger hand seal with both hands, and shouted, Explode! The ceiling formation instantly activated, and the explosive tags burned and detonated in an instant. Boom! The power of ten explosive tags was exceptionally immense. The entire building trembled, and dust rained down. If the factory building wasn't relatively sturdy, and if the explosion hadn't hit a load-bearing wall, the building might have collapsed instantly. Inside the basement level, there were cries of agony. As the explosive tags detonated, they blasted the vault door inward. Three of the six guards behind the door were standing too close and were crushed by the impact of the door flying in. The other guards were hit by flying debris and stones, leaving them injured. Charles Doyle saw that the path to the basement level was now open, so he didn't hesitate any longer. He entered holding his kunau. Tana was injured but not severely. As soon as he saw someone approaching, he was about to open fire. However, he hadn't had the chance to pull the trigger. Charles Doyle appeared beside him and swiftly stabbed his back with the kunau, piercing his throat. Tana was killed instantly. Then, with a flicker of movement, Charles Doyle was before another injured guard. He aimed his kunau at the guard's heart and thrust it forward. Puchi. The sound of the blade piercing flesh. In the next second, Charles Doyle withdrew the kunau and moved towards the third guard. From the explosion to now, only two seconds had passed. What had been a six-person guard squad was now reduced to just Modi. He had avoided the vault door earlier by going to make a phone call, and he had also escaped the flying debris. However, what was happening in front of him was too shocking for him to process. Devil! As Modi yelled, he squeezed the trigger of his assault rifle, sending bullets pouring in the direction of Charles Doyle. At this point, Charles Doyle swung his kunau with both hands, creating countless afterimages. Each incoming bullet was deflected by the kunau. Soon, the ammunition in Modi's assault rifle was depleted, and it clicked, jammed. Just as he was about to reach for the handgun at his waist, a kunau came flying towards him. Swoosh! The kunau went straight through Modi's throat, and then his body jerked before falling backward. From this point on, all the Russian gang members in the factory had been mercilessly slaughtered by Charles Doyle. Chapter 12, Reliable Secretary At this moment, Abram Tarasov, who was stationed at the auto repair shop, had just gathered all his men. He looked at the nearly hundred subordinates below, 
all equipped with firearms, and nodded in satisfaction. He then waved his hand and ordered, let's go. Instantly, everyone turned around and got into the cars. The engines roared to life as the convoy of about 20 vehicles left the repair shop, forming a formidable procession. They headed towards the outskirts of Brooklyn. Abram Tarasov was accompanied by three burly men in suits. These three individuals were his bodyguards, and they escorted him into a Cadillac SUV. The vehicle started up and followed the convoy. He wanted to see who had the audacity to attack the Russian gang at this time. After clearing out all the guards, Charles Doyle finally stopped to examine the basement. The basement wasn't large, but it was divided by a heavy iron door into two sections. One area was where Charles had just battled, and the other side was densely packed with boxes. Glancing at the iron door, Charles placed his right hand on the keypad lock. In the next moment, lightning flashed across his hand. Instantly, the keypad lock malfunctioned, and the iron door swung open. Stepping into the room, he looked at the boxes before him. Charles randomly selected one to open, and as he did, he felt like the entire room was bathed in a golden glow. Indeed, it was a box of gold. Gold bars were neatly stacked within the box. Charles reached in and took one out, examining it closely. He applied pressure with his fingers, leaving an imprint on the gold bar. After feeling its hardness and observing its color, he confirmed that these were indeed real gold bars, not fake. He then tossed the gold bar back into the box and opened another box nearby. This box contained nothing but jewelry and gemstones, with a particularly eye-catching blue sapphire on top. Charles picked it up and weighed it in his hand, it was more than a hundred carats. After inspecting two boxes in a row, Charles Doyle became curious about the remaining boxes. He counted them and found that there were still twenty unopened boxes. Could they all be filled with gold and jewelry? This Russian gang must be incredibly wealthy. Charles opened another box, only to find it filled with shining American knives and bundles of $10 bills neatly tied together. Observing the $10 bills, Charles felt somewhat disappointed. Although the box was large, how much could a bunch of $10 bills amount to? Nonetheless, it was true that the main currency denomination for everyday transactions in the United States was the $10 bill. If someone used a bunch of $100 bills for spending, they would likely draw suspicion and trigger an investigation. Not dwelling on this matter, Charles opened all the boxes and found that they were all filled with US dollars. There were no other items, let alone jewels, luxury watches, or even physical gold. All 20 boxes contained US currency. As for the total amount, he wasn't sure yet. Staring at the 22 boxes before him, while someone else might worry about how to discreetly take away so many boxes, it wasn't a concern for Charles Doyle. After all, his copper coins had the power of bidirectional exchange. Placing his hands on the pile of money, Charles Doyle silently whispered in his mind, Recharge. Instantly, all the cash inside the boxes vanished, and on the ninja panel in his mind, the digits under the copper coins category jumped rapidly for about three breaths before coming to a halt. Now, the number in the copper coins column read 4.2 million, where 200,000 copper coins were earned from a previous mission. Therefore, his current earnings amounted to 4 million US dollars. 20 boxes, each containing $200,000 in cash, totaling $4 million. Charles Doyle was quite satisfied with the gains from this operation. Not only did he clean up the scum of society, but he also acquired a substantial sum of money. These earnings far surpassed the rewards offered for John Wick, and the best part was that this money didn't have to be shared with the Continental Hotel. Aside from using it for repairing cars, he could also consider upgrading his ninja dog. After all, Upgrading summoning beasts consumes a lot of copper coins. As for the other two boxes containing gold and jewelry, he stored them in the storage space provided by his system. With everything done, Charles dispelled his transformation jutsu and walked out of the factory. A red Ferrari 458 was parked on the street. His eyebrows raised slightly as he approached the car, opened the passenger side door, and got in. My reliable secretary, you've arrived just in time. I was just thinking about how to get a ride from this place. Charles Doyle looked at the blonde woman before him and spoke with a smile, closing the car door behind him. As a reward for you, I have a little gift to give. In the next moment, the blue sapphire that he had just stored in his storage space appeared in his hand once more. Seeing the blue sapphire that was larger than a pigeon egg in Charles's hand, Ginny's eyes gleamed like a greedy dragon spotting treasure. The gem sparkled with a dazzling light. Boss, you're so generous. 
Ginny embraced Charles Doyle, then planted a big kiss on his lips before taking the blue sapphire from his hand. Boss, does this blue sapphire have a name? Charles wiped off the lipstick marks from his face and looked at the beaming blonde woman. He replied, you can give it a name you like. After all, you're its owner now. Ginny was a bit disappointed that her boss didn't even know the original name of the gem. Observing the scene of her placing the gem in a secret place, Charles Doyle swallowed a mouthful of saliva. Hearing the sound of him swallowing, Ginny chuckled. Then she said, Boss, your Mercedes has been arranged for repairs. When it's fixed, they'll contact you. Now, are you returning to Charles's agency or going back to Chrysler Building? Charles Doyle nodded, quite satisfied with Ginny's efficiency. He then slowly said, Take me back to the Chrysler Building. Hearing the mention of the Chrysler Building, Ginny didn't say more. She started the car, pressed the gas pedal, and the Ferrari instantly sped off into the distance. The moment the car left, the weather outside changed. Raindrops began to fall from the sky, transitioning from a light drizzle to a heavy downpour in an instant. Gazing at the pouring rain outside the car window, Charles Doyle's thoughts drifted far away, thinking Vigo would finally meet his end at the hands of John. T slash N, from this week, I will be posting extra chapters based on the numbers of Power Stones. So be sure to give your Power Stones if you like this fanfiction. For more details, check on the auxiliary chapter that will be posted in a while. For more chapters, 15 plus p at trian.com slash kvtsi. Chapter 13, Legendary Assassin Charles Doyle After Charles Doyle and his group had been gone for half an hour, Abram Tarasov arrived with a group of his men at the outskirts of the Brooklyn factory. Accompanied by one of his bodyguards who held a black umbrella, Abram entered the factory. However, both inside and outside the factory, there was an eerie silence. Abram's strategist approached him and spoke, They're all dead, none of our guys made it. Abram's expression twitched, and he said, Looks like we arrived a bit too late. Do you know who did this? Any clues left behind? Abram asked two questions in a row. His strategist paused and then responded, Abram, you should come and see for yourself. The bodies of all the deceased had been brought together and arranged neatly on an open space. Abram walked over, surveying the scene more than forty bodies in total, some mangled beyond recognition, with limbs piled together, creating an eerie and horrifying atmosphere. He tightened his coat, trying to ward off the coldness he was feeling. As he looked at the bodies, he noticed that apart from the three individuals killed by the vault door, the rest had either been blown up or had their throats slit there were hardly any gunshot wounds. The strategist approached Abram with a piece of cloth in his hands, on which were laid several shurikens and kunau. Abram, we found these on some of the bodies. These should be left by the culprit. Gazing at the shurikens and kunau, Abram's massive frame trembled slightly. He muttered to himself, Ninja. Confused by Abram's words, the strategist asked, what? Seeing his strategist's puzzled expression, Abram continued, the one who carried out this attack is Charles Doyle. It's the second legendary assassin to gain a reputation after the Night Devil, John Wick, from the Continental Assassin Hotel. He's known as a ninja, primarily using shurikens and kunau as his weapons. Relying on these child's play weapons, Charles Doyle wiped out an entire heavily armed African-American gang. Upon hearing Abram's explanation, the strategist was clearly taken aback, his mouth gaping in disbelief. It was indeed hard to fathom. Glancing at the forty or so bodies on the ground, the strategist nodded in a daze. Someone had truly accomplished this. After all, the evidence was right in front of them, disbelief was no longer an option. Abram Tarasov spoke at this moment, what's the result from the basement vault? How much did we lose? The strategist hesitated for a moment before speaking, everything is gone. There's nothing left except empty boxes. Damn it, bastards. Abram Tarasov cursed, damn Rusov, damn Vigo. Look at what kind of people you two have provoked. After cursing for a while, he instructed, leave some people to clean up the scene, the rest of us will go back. After finishing his orders, Abram Tarasov returned to his car under the escort of three bodyguards. Meanwhile, the cursed big brother Vigo was currently engaged in a fierce battle with John Wick in the pouring rain. Despite being the leader of a gang, Vigo Tarasov's combat skills were clearly inferior to the professional assassin John Wick. He was at a clear disadvantage in this hand-to-hand -hand fight. Vigo Tarasov suddenly pulled out a short knife from behind and lunged at the unarmed John Wick. The two of them exchanged blows for a few rounds, 
with neither managing to land a hit. In a moment of opportunity, Vigo quickly gripped the short knife and attempted to stab John Wick in the abdomen. John Wick reacted just in time, catching Vigo's stabbing hand with both of his own. Vigo's hand holding the knife was captured by John Wick, and they were locked in a tense struggle. Vigo quickly used his other hand to attack John's neck and even grabbed his head. Despite the brutal blows, John Wick didn't let go of Vigo's grip but instead used Vigo's own hold to guide the knife into his own abdomen. He then grasped Vigo Tarasov's arm and forcefully snapped it in half. Ah! The pain from the broken bones caused Vigo Tarasov to scream out, and he staggered back. Seeing Vigo approaching again, John swiftly counterattacked, landing a punch that pushed Vigo back. John Wick, who had retreated, glanced at the knife in his abdomen and used both hands to grip the hilt before pulling it out. As Vigo advanced once again, trying to capitalize on his momentum, John Wick blocked a punch with his arm and simultaneously inserted the knife into Vigo's right shoulder and neck. Vigo Tarasov was instantly struck at a critical point. In a final counterattack, he landed a punch on the downed John Wick, then instantly lost his strength, collapsing on the ground, clutching the wound on his neck, and gazing silently at John Wick. At this moment, John Wick also sat down on the ground, both hands pressing on his abdominal wound. With the knowledge that his time was limited, Vigo Tarasov spoke in the pouring rain, John, I'll be waiting for you in hell. John Wick, also clutching his wounded abdomen, replied, All right, see you on the other side. With a great effort, John got up and staggered away into the distance amidst the pouring rain. Vigo Tarasov closed his eyes. On the other side. Ginny had driven Charles Doyle to the front of the Chrysler building. As she parked the car and saw that Charles was about to get out and leave, Ginny spoke up, Charles, why don't you invite me up for a drink? As she spoke, Ginny playfully flicked her golden hair hanging beside her ear, making her look especially alluring. Charles Doyle glanced at Ginny's inquiring expression and replied as he opened the car door, Ginny, it's getting late, and we have work tomorrow. You should head back quickly. With those words, Charles Doyle had already gotten out of the car. He then turned and said to Ginny, Good night, Ginny. Take care on the way back and sweet dreams. After saying that, Charles Doyle entered the Chrysler building. Still in the sports car, Ginny raised her middle finger toward Charles's retreating figure and muttered, Bastard. She then stepped hard on the accelerator, causing the fiery red Ferrari to spin in place, make a quick U-turn, and speed away. Although Charles Doyle hadn't witnessed what was happening behind him, he could still guess what was going on based on Ginny's frustrated reaction. Chapter 14, Ninja Dog, Parker Regarding the American blonde beauty, Charles Doyle was actually quite satisfied. However, as his assistant, he didn't want to turn her into his lover. Although in American love stories, having a passionate encounter and then going back to normal the next day is considered okay, Charles Doyle has a strong possessive nature. If something does happen between them, he would want to be the only partner in her life. Turning a subordinate into a romantic interest would complicate their working relationship, and he was dissatisfied with that outcome. To avoid getting tangled up in such matters, Charles Doyle chose to decline Ginny's advances. Moreover, American blonde bombshells weren't really his type. Back at home, Charles Doyle retrieved a bottle of Jack Daniels from the liquor cabinet and poured himself a glass, adding a touch of cola. After taking a sip, he nodded in approval. Thinking about today's gains, he decided to spend some time in the system interface. Setting down the glass, he entered the system interface and accessed his information. Charles Doyle. Age, 21. Occupation, Ninja. VIP Level, 0. Attributes, Fire, Lightning. Equipment, Chunin Shuriken, Chunin Headband, Chunin Vest, Chunin Manual, Chunin Necklace. Chunin Ring, Equipment Increases Damage and Protection. Artifact, None. Scrolls, Ninja Art, Endurance LV2, Reduces Damage by 90% upon use for 4 seconds, Note, Cannot Reduce Fatal Damage. Ninjutsu Art, Fury LV1, Increases Attack Power by 6% for 10 seconds. Owned Ninjas, Suzuki Uchiha, Without Sharingan, Irika Umino, Rock Lee. Owned Skills, Fire Style. Great Fireball Jutsu, Lion Barrage, Chidori, Shuriken Jutsu, Ceiling Formation, Roar of Love, Infinite Dance, Leaf Whirlwind. As for his own chakra capacity, it wasn't particularly large. The system has been activated for only three years, and over that time, through meditation, 
he has managed to refine only a modest amount of chakra. In contrast, in the Naruto world, children started refining chakra at the age of four or five, trained for six years at the Ninja Academy, and only become a genin after those six years. The amount of chakra they had was barely enough to perform a few jutsu. Nevertheless, his training progress was fairly good, about the level of an ordinary ninja. It was important to note that the cell density in the Marvel world's humans was two to three times lower than that in the Naruto world. Ordinarily, this would mean that both chakra generation and training speed would be two to three times slower. However, Charles Doyle found that his progress was more akin to that of an average genins in the anime, not as slow as he had expected. This was likely due to the influence of the system he had acquired during his time of transmigration. Furthermore, as the host of the system, Charles realized that every time he successfully summoned a C-rank ninja, it would increase his chakra pool by that of a genin. After testing it out, he found that a genin's chakra capacity was enough for him to perform the chidori, a jutsu of that level, three times. Currently, Charles's total chakra capacity was enough to perform the A-rank jutsu chidori ten times. After reviewing his attributes, Charles accessed the summoning beast interface, where only one type of summoning beast was highlighted, the ninja dog. The interface displayed three ninja dogs, Parker, Urushi, and Shiba. However, in actual usage, Kakashi's pack of eight ninja dogs could all be summoned. At this moment, Charles's ninja dogs were at level 20, and their strength was not weak. However, he needed to level them up to the maximum of 50 in order to unlock the next summoning beast. To increase a ninja dog's level from 20 to 21, it required 300 reputation points and 30,000 copper coins with each subsequent level up consuming more resources. Glancing at his current copper coin balance of 4.2 million and reputation value of 20,000, he hoped that the reputation points would be sufficient. Charles began the journey of leveling up his ninja dog. After spending 20,000 reputation points and 2 million copper coins, he finally managed to level up his ninja dog to the maximum level of 50, unlocking the next summoning beast, AODA. In the next moment, a summoning beast scroll appeared before Charles Doyle. Opening it, the scroll depicted the image of a blue snake, with an empty space for the name of the contracted summoner. Using a shuriken, Charles Doyle pricked his finger and wrote his name in the designated spot. Once he finished, the summoning beast scroll vanished. With this, he could now summon AODA. However, considering the size of the snake and the space in his room, he decided to skip the summoning for now. As for the strength of this summoning beast, he glanced at his remaining 96 reputation points and shook his head. He would have to gradually level it up in the future. First, he decided to see what the fully leveled Parker was like. He summoned the summoning beast with a burst of smoke. As the smoke cleared, Parker's figure appeared in front of him. Charles, did you summon me for a mission? Parker asked. By the way, thank you for restoring our full strength. Feeling Parker's aura, Charles realized that he probably wouldn't even stand a chance against a dog using only his physical strength without using ninjutsu. No mission, Parker. I just wanted to confirm a few things with you. After your strength has been fully restored, can you continue to improve? Parker looked at Charles and his face took on a human-like expression of contemplation before he spoke, Charles, we ninja dogs are already adults, and our strength is mostly fixed. It's difficult for us to further improve through training. Then Parker looked at Charles with a hopeful expression and continued, Charles, can you help us increase our strength? Charles glanced at the summoning beast interface, where the ninja dog's training position was marked as max level. He sighed, sorry, Parker, but I can't help with that. However, you can try to improve your strength through training in the summoning world. Parker sniffed and looked at Charles, asking, did you contract with Ryakai Caves guys? Charles thought to himself. Truly a tracking dog he had only touched the scroll briefly and Parker had already detected its scent. Charles sighed inwardly, I haven't formed a contract with Ryakai Cave. I've just made a contract with AODA. AODA. Parker looked puzzled, he didn't know who AODA was, but he was familiar with Manda, that guy. There's going to be a new addition to the summoning world. Things are about to get lively. But Charles, if you get the chance, I hope you can summon Kakashi. After all, it's been quite some time since we've come here, and I miss him. Looking at Parker, Charles said, there will be a chance, though I don't know which time period Kakashi will be from. Thank you, Charles. If there's nothing else, I'll return to the summoning world. Charles Doyle waved his hand, until next time, 
Parker. With a burst of smoke, Parker disappeared the next second, returning to the summoning world. Chapter 15, Assassin Brotherhood Seeing Parker had returned to the summoning world, Charles couldn't help but marvel at the greatness of the system. Upon first learning that beings like Parker existed in the summoning world rather than the system space, he had instructed Parker to use reverse summoning to bring him into the summoning world. That is a separate world, a world used by the system to house summoning beasts. His eight ninja dogs lived in that realm. As for the exact size of that world, Charles Doyle didn't know and hadn't explored it yet. He couldn't go beyond the Inuzuka mountain, probably because he hadn't unlocked other summoning beasts. However, at the moment, besides him and his summoning beasts, no one else should be able to enter this summoning world. He just wondered if the masters of other dimensions or deities would discover it. Looking at his nearly depleted reputation points on the system interface, Charles Doyle shook his head. Besides the ninja summons, he still had to worry about this reputation value. After finishing the whiskey in his glass, Charles Doyle returned to bed to sleep. The next day. The first thing Charles Doyle did when he woke up was to log into the system interface to check in. Ding, check in successful. Received one ninja recruitment scroll. Would you like to upgrade to VIP 2 to receive double scrolls? Seeing that today's check-in reward was a ninja recruitment scroll, Charles Doyle felt quite pleased. As for the so-called upgrade option, he could only mercilessly tap the X. It wasn't that he didn't want to, but he genuinely didn't know how to upgrade. Sometimes he wanted to ask the system, open your mouth and tell me what I need to successfully upgrade. I'll find a way to get it and make sure you succeed in upgrading. But what frustrated him was that this system didn't have customer service. Not to mention customer service, it didn't even have a system spirit. He had to figure things out on his own. Luckily, he was quite familiar with the Naruto, Shinobi collection game. Looking at the five ninja summoning scrolls he has saved up, Charles thought to himself that in another two months, when he has a total of ten scrolls, he could try summoning new ninjas. It wasn't that he didn't want to do a single summon, but to guarantee summoning a ninja, he had to perform a ten summon. Given his inability to upgrade and having already exhausted all his luck from the time he crossed over, he shouldn't even think about miracles happening with a single summon. After closing the system interface, getting ready, and putting on the bulletproof suit custom made at the Continental Hotel, Charles Doyle took a taxi to his office located at 71 Forest Hills Avenue, Indiana, the Queens District. Pushing open the door to the office, just as Irika Umino was about to greet whoever had entered, he saw that it was Charles Doyle and immediately stood up, saying, Good morning, Lord Charles. Irika, have there been any tasks assigned to the office these past couple of days? Irika picked up the task list from the table and said, Searching for a lost cat and investigating whether a husband is having an affair those are the only two tasks we have. The rest have all been completed. Currently, the tasks have been assigned to Suzuki and Rock Lee, so they should be able to complete them smoothly. Hearing that there were only these two tasks, Charles Doyle felt a bit helpless. These tasks were obviously derank missions if you put them in the mission center. But, a mosquito was still meat. Afterward, he said, Irika. Hand me the signed task scrolls. Lord Charles, here are the task scrolls. Irika took out two signed task scrolls from the cabinet and handed them to Charles. Charles took the scrolls and then opened the system interface, entering the mission center to submit the two scrolls. After being appraised by the mission center, both tasks were classified as derank missions, each with a reward of 200 reputation points and 5,000 copper coins. Seeing these mission rewards, Charles Doyle couldn't help feeling a bit depressed. We'll have to build a reputation for our firm. The rewards for these low-level tasks are just too low. Irika, do you have any good suggestions? Could we arrange for Rock Lee and Suzuki to take orders at the Continental Hotel? The bounties over there are pretty good. With their strength, I think they can handle some ordinary assassination tasks. Irika presented his suggestion, while Charles Doyle shook his head. Irika for the tasks from the Continental Hotel, except for those I personally accept and complete, the tasks you receive can't be submitted to the Mission Center. Lord Charles, I can't think of any good suggestions at the moment. The proportion of higher level tasks in the firm is indeed quite low. Usually, we can only get one or two decent tasks per month. They mainly involve assassination tasks, which are pretty much monopolized by the Continental Hotel. Our reputation here is still too small. Only some employers who can't even afford the gold coins come to us to place orders. 
Irika had one more thing to say both Lee and Suzuki were quite young, and they both had an Asian appearance. In the eyes of customers, they weren't taken very seriously. If it weren't for carrying Charles's name, they probably wouldn't get any tasks at all. After all, if someone wanted Charles to take action, they could directly place an order at the Continental Hotel. With the backing of the hotel, their credibility was assured. Hearing that the Continental Hotel was squeezing out their space to operate, Charles furrowed his brow slightly, thinking to himself, it seems that getting one of the twelve seats at the high table is becoming more urgent. Only by becoming part of the high table leadership could he incorporate tasks from the Continental Hotel into the firm. By then, the ninjas he recruited could also take on the Continental Hotel's tasks and upload them to the system's mission center. John Wick, Winston, I hope you don't make me wait too long. While Charles was lost in thought, Ginny walked in, with a smile on her face and a sweet tone as she spoke, Boss, did I hear you complain about not having any big contracts? Looking at Ginny as she spoke, Charles wasn't sure if it was an illusion or because of the big contract, but he felt that Ginny looked exceptionally charming today. Clearing his throat, Charles looked at Ginny and asked, Secretary Ginny, did you bring some good news? Ginny wasn't making a humorous joke this time, she spoke seriously, Boss, would you be interested in taking on a mission related to the Assassin Brotherhood? Hearing the name Assassin Brotherhood, Charles's thoughts drifted away for a moment. In his previous life, he seemed to have seen a movie called Wanted, which told the story of the Assassin Brotherhood. However, he wasn't sure if it was the same one. He responded with uncertainty, is it the Assassin Brotherhood with the bullet bending? Ginny nodded and answered, yes, it's that Assassin Brotherhood. Sure, I'll take it, as long as it's a big contract. Ginny took out her phone and dialed a number, saying, come in. In the next moment, a middle-aged man with curly hair pushed open the door and entered Charles's office. Chapter 16, Adding Money Cross had been waiting outside for a while. He had come to Ginny out of necessity. Since Ginny had left the Assassin Brotherhood about a year ago, they had a good relationship. If it weren't for Sloane targeting his son, he wouldn't have bothered Ginny. When his phone rang and he heard the words come in, Cross felt relieved. It seemed that they were ready to discuss this matter. Entering Charles's office, Cross looked at the three people in the room an Asian man with a scar on his face, a handsome young man, and Ginny. He wasn't sure who to talk to about the mission, so he looked at Ginny. Ginny introduced, Boss, this is Cross. He's the one who needs our help. Cross, this is my boss, Charles Doyle. He can help you with your situation. Hearing Ginny's introduction and looking at the middle-aged man before him, Charles's mental image of Cross from movie started to align with the image of the man in front of him. Charles then recalled that the Assassin Brotherhood seemed to have a certain treasure, as well as an enigmatic item. The treasure referred to the ointment used by the Assassin Brotherhood injuries like bruises, cuts, and fractures would heal within a few hours. For Charles, who currently didn't have medical ninjas or medical ninjutsu, this secret formula was a valuable asset. The other enigmatic item was the Loom of Fate. After weaving fabric, this loom would leave behind special numbers. Decrypting these binary numbers would reveal names, and then the Assassin Brotherhood would send assassins to kill those individuals. The Loom of Fate determined the life and morality of certain people. The people whose names appeared were all wrongdoers, destined to be killed, even if they hadn't committed any crimes yet. Fox's childhood experience was a testament to the authenticity of the Loom of Fate. The Assassin Brotherhood existed for centuries because of this loom. This might sound quite absurd in a modern society, a group of skilled assassins obeying the commands of a loom to carry out killings. But Charles considered that this wasn't a simple modern society, it was a marvel world where technology, magic, and divine powers coexisted. Perhaps this loom of fate was truly exceptional? Who knows, it could be a treasure related to fate. All these thoughts flashed through his mind in an instant. Charles warmly said, Irika, please take our guest to the meeting room. Seeing Charles so enthusiastic, Ginny also smiled and led Cross into the meeting room. Irika then came over and asked, what would you all like to drink? Coffee, whiskey, or iced water? Charles smiled and said, Give me a glass of whiskey. Ginny smiled and said, I'll have a cup of coffee. Cross said, Iced water. Please wait a moment, I'll be back soon, Irika said and quickly left to fulfill the requests. Charles then said, Mr. Cross, please tell us about your mission. Cross straightened his posture, took out a photo from his pocket, placed it on the table, and began, 
I need you to send someone to protect my son. He's been targeted by Sloan of the Assassin Brotherhood. I'm afraid I can't take him away, so I have to trouble you to provide protection. Charles picked up the photo and took a look. Yes, it was that unfortunate kid who had been watched by his father, betrayed by his girlfriend, and ultimately deceived by Sloan and others, leading to him killing his own father. Mr. Cross, I've heard that you recently left this organization. I presume you have some understanding of their strength. An organization that has existed for centuries won't easily give up on targeting someone. Cross hesitated for a moment and asked, What do you mean? Charles's face lit up with a smile, and he said, It's about adding money. Just as Cross was about to speak, a knock on the door interrupted him. Irika walked in with their beverages, placed them on the table, and then left. He needed to stay outside in case more guests arrived for reception. Charles picked up the whiskey on the table, took a sip, and gestured for Cross to continue the topic. Cross picked up the glass of iced water and drank it all in one gulp before speaking slowly, three million. I'll pay three million US dollars, and I hope you can ensure the safety of my son. Charles calmly spoke two words, the duration. Why? Seeing Cross still somewhat perplexed, Charles explained, Mr. Cross, although I haven't investigated in detail yet, if I'm not mistaken, you've had conflicts with the Assassin Brotherhood. It's no problem for us to protect your son, but for how long? Is it one week, two weeks, a month, or even longer? Or are we supposed to wait until your situation with the Assassin Brotherhood is completely resolved? Hearing Charles's words, Cross was also taken aback. Indeed, how long should they protect his son? While three million wasn't a small amount, protecting his son from the Assassin Brotherhood would require top-tier strength. Just like a sheep couldn't protect its young from a pack of wolves, how could Cross expect his son to be safe from the Brotherhood? However, trying to hire a top-tier assassin like Charles to protect someone, especially for an extended period, wasn't feasible with just three million dollars. After some contemplation, Cross said, five million, for a month. If he couldn't resolve the situation with Sloan within a month, then his own demise wasn't far off. After all, Sloan wouldn't let him go. Regardless of the outcome, there would eventually be a conclusion to this matter. If he won, there wouldn't be much to say. If he lost, Sloan wouldn't even spare a thought for his ordinary son. Hearing Cross raise the price to $5 million for a month of protection, Charles offered a suggestion, Sir, I have a proposal let's split this mission into two parts. For the first task, you pay $3 million, and our agency will provide comprehensive protection for your son, ensuring his safety. For the second task, you pay for my services to eliminate the Assassin Brotherhood. Upon hearing Charles's words, not only Cross but even Ginny widened her eyes. Ginny had left the Assassin Brotherhood because she no longer believed in Sloan or the Loom of Fate. Hearing the suggestion to eliminate the Assassin Brotherhood caught her off guard. Cross took a moment to compose himself, thought it over, and said, Sir, I don't have that much money. I can't afford the price to have you eliminate the Assassin Brotherhood. After all, the Assassin Brotherhood wasn't just a handful of people, it was an organization that had been passed down for thousands of years, with a substantial number of members. Chapter 17, The Commission from the Cross Observing Cross's hesitation due to financial constraints, Charles chuckled, aside from the five million, how much more can you afford? Cross paused and replied, I can come up with an additional one million, but that amount won't cover the fee for your assistance. He was well aware of Charles's price starting at a million dollars for a standard assassination. If the opponent was formidable, the price could easily go up to four million or even higher. Considering the size of the Assassin Brotherhood such a massive organization it wasn't merely killing one person, it was about annihilating the entire organization's active force. And on top of that, it was about eradicating a group of assassins. No assassin would accept such a mission. Even putting the mission on the Continental Hotel wouldn't work unless the high table got involved. Seeing that Cross had one million left, Charles proposed, Here's an idea, Mr. Cross. You provide three million for hiring us to protect your son, and an additional three million along with the recipe for the healing bath. This will be for hiring me to eliminate the Assassin Brotherhood. As for the protection time for your son Wesley, we'll use the eradication of the Assassin Brotherhood as the end point. But I must mention that after eradicating the Brotherhood, I'll claim the spoils as well. Upon hearing the term healing bath, Cross glanced at Ginny, assuming she had informed Charles. After a moment of contemplation, he said, all of this is acceptable. My goal is to destroy them, 
and I don't care about their inheritance. But if you and I go to eradicate the Assassin Brotherhood, who will protect my son? After all, the Assassins the Brotherhood sends out are not ordinary people. Charles exuded confidence and seriousness as he said, Mr. Cross, this is an agency, and it's not just me. We also have two incredibly skilled ninjas here, and you've already met Irika. He'll be part of the team protecting your son. I will dispatch Irika as the leader, accompanied by Rock Lee and Uchiha Suzuki, to provide comprehensive protection for your son. Their strength is even greater than you might imagine. While Cross didn't know who Rock Lee and Uchiha Suzuki were, he had a deep impression of the scarred man from earlier. Although the man's face didn't reveal any murderous intent and even carried a sense of being a teacher, Cross sensed danger emanating from him. Yes, he was sensing danger, not only from the Asian man but also from Charles himself. Over the years, his safety wasn't solely because of bullet time or his gun kata techniques, it was also due to his inexplicable sense of danger. Despite knowing the other's formidable strength, Cross still looked at Ginny for assurance. He wanted a definitive answer from her. Seeing Cross's questioning gaze, Ginny spoke, Cross, you can completely trust their abilities. They'll protect your son without any problems. If you're still worried, I'll join Irika's team as well, and we'll protect Wesley together. Hearing Ginny's words, Cross felt reassured and said, All right, then let's split the task into two commissions. Seeing Cross agree, Charles said, Ginny, bring in two sets of task scrolls for us to sign. Ginny left the meeting room to notify Irika to prepare the task scrolls for signing. Mr. Charles, how do you think it's best to pay for the task rewards? Cross asked, seeking Charles's opinion on the matter. Charles looked at Cross and said, Credit card, cash we accept both. After all, my agency is a legitimate business, and we pay our taxes on time. Then let's go with a credit card. I'll pay the entire sum up front. As for the recipe for the bath, I'll give it to you after the operation. Charles shrugged, indicating it was fine. After all, no employer would pay the entire fee all at once. At that moment, Irika entered the room with two sets of task scrolls. After writing down the task details, rewards, and other relevant information, Cross signed the task scrolls, paid the fees, provided some information about his son, and then left Charles's agency. The protection mission for Wesley would begin tomorrow, and as for the eradication mission, they would need to wait for Cross to give the green light, as he needed to make some preparations first. As Cross left, Ginny's brow furrowed slightly, and she asked Charles, Charles, are you really going to join Cross in eradicating the Assassin Brotherhood? Even though I introduced Cross here, the eradication of the Brotherhood. It's not without risks, and lives could be lost. They're not like the assassins from the Continental Hotel. Their shots are lethal, and their bullets can't be stopped by your bulletproof vest. Charles chuckled and said, Ginny, you have to trust your boss. I wouldn't have proposed this task if I didn't have confidence in completing it. Don't worry. Seeing Ginny still worried, Charles didn't linger on the topic and said, Starting tomorrow, you and Irika will form a four-person team to protect Wesley. You should also stay safe. I have an additional task for you. Keep an eye on news about John Wick. If you hear anything about his house getting blown up, make sure to inform me immediately. John Wick? I heard he killed Vigo last night. Despite that, someone still dared to blow up his house. Charles smiled and said, There will always be some daredevils, just like Vigo's son. Ginny sighed and said, All right, boss, but remember to give me a bonus. No problem. After seeing Ginny off, Charles picked up the two sets of task scrolls from the table, entered the system interface, opened the task assembly, and submitted the protection mission for Wesley. Soon, the task assembly evaluated it as a B rank mission, offering 2,000 reputation points, 200,000 copper coins, and a common treasure chest upon completion. Satisfied with the prospect of getting a treasure chest, Charles submitted the mission. The other mission could only be submitted after Rock Lee and Suzuki completes their task today. However, Charles had a hunch that the eradication mission would be classified as an A-rank mission. Leaving the meeting room, Charles saw that Ginny and Irika were discussing the protection of Wesley and the potential strength of enemies the Assassin Brotherhood might send, while formulating a preliminary battle plan. Chapter 18, Wesley Charles saw that they were busy and didn't want to disturb them. He headed to the front desk opened the drawer where the car keys were stored, and looked at the several car keys inside. Charles said, Irika, I'll take the Porsche from the garage for now. 
Master, those cars were bought by you, so feel free to drive any of them. Charles waved his hand, then left the agency and went to the backyard garage. He looked at the bulky Porsche SUV in front of him, shook his head, feeling that it wasn't as stylish as his own Mercedes. He wondered how long it would take to repair his car. Without dwelling on it too much, he opened the car door, started the engine, and prepared to head back to Chrysler Building. Since there wasn't much going on for the moment, he planned to return and refine his chakra. After all, nothing could compare to the joy of improving one's strength. In the evening, after Rock Lee and Uchiha Suzuki completed their mission, they unexpectedly returned to Charles's agency together. Upon entering, they found Irika and Ginny waiting for them, looking puzzled. They asked, is there a new mission? Irika spoke up, yes, a new mission, a Birank mission. Rock Lee clenched his fists and looked up at the ceiling, exclaiming, Youth! Leave this high-level mission to me, Rock Lee. Finishing his words, he struck a classic pose and extended his arm, giving a thumbs up to Irika and Ginny. Over the past year, Ginny thought she had become accustomed to Rock Lee's antics, which she considered a form of performance art. But seeing Rock Lee's behavior like this again made her feel awkward. Idiot! Suzuki, who was on the side, spoke in a calm tone, Irika sensei said it's a B-rank mission, so it's definitely a team mission. A genin like you can't handle it alone. Upon hearing that it was a team mission, Rock Lee didn't show any signs of disappointment. On the contrary, his fighting spirit was even higher. Lee, Suzuki, come here. Let me first explain the mission details. This time, it's a protection mission involving a client who might be targeted by assassins, Irika said, motioning for them to gather around. The four of them began discussing the mission, quickly devising a solid plan. The next day, after a night of training, Charles had finished refining his chakra. He opened the system interface and selected the daily check-in. Ding! Check-in successful, earned 200 reputation points. He then clicked on the task assembly section and saw that both Uchiha Sasuke's and Rock Lee's tasks were marked as completed. He clicked to collect the rewards. He received 400 reputation points and 10,000 copper coins as rewards. Afterward, he selected to submit the task scroll he had brought back the previous day. Quickly, after the task was assessed, the mission to eliminate the Assassin Brotherhood was rated as an A-rank mission. The rewards were even more substantial, 5,000 reputation points 500,000 copper coins, and an exquisite treasure chest. The exquisite treasure chest contained random rewards such as reputation points, gold coins, summon scrolls, and A-B level ninja fragments. Compared to a regular treasure chest, the rewards inside an exquisite treasure chest were better. As for the mysterious treasure chest rewards from S-rank missions, Charles hadn't yet come across them. Glancing at his account, he had 496 reputation points 2.21 million copper coins, 0 gold coins, and 5 ninja recruitment scrolls. The glaring zero was still as prominent as ever, just like his VIP zero status. Charles closed the system interface, stood up, and began preparing some equipment, such as attaching an explosive tag to a shuriken. After all, the textile factory was a sizable place with numerous employees. Carrying shuriken with explosive tags could serve as effective makeshift bombs. The explosive tags provided by the system were all high-quality ones, with an explosion radius of 3 meters. With his Uchiha shuriken throwing technique, they became accurately guided bombs. As Charles began preparing his combat tools, on the other side, Irika's team had already set off. At this moment, outside Wesley's house, in a concealed location under a bridge, Suzuki spoke softly through his earpiece. The target has appeared and is currently at the workplace ahead. Follow the target, Suzuki, and don't let him notice you. Lee, keep a constant watch on the surroundings of the target to prevent any unexpected incidents. Got it. X2. Wow, he nearly got hit by a car. This guy is really clumsy. In a room, Irika was currently overseeing the team's actions. He turned to Ginny and asked, when should we approach him and tell him that we're here to protect him on behalf of his father? Let's wait until he gets off work, and then the two of us can approach him. Irika complained, this guy is so clueless and careless. I'm worried that he might not die from an assassination but from some accident like a car crash. It might be better if we provide close protection or even take him back to the agency directly. Ginny smiled, Captain Irika, let's stick to the plan. The group soon followed the target, Wesley, to the building where he worked. 
They were currently observing his every move from a building outside the main office. Time passed quickly, and evening arrived. After finishing work, Wesley left the company building and went to an ATM machine to withdraw some money. Unfortunately, his bank card had less than $20 in it. Just as Wesley was about to complain, two figures suddenly appeared on his left and right. Startled, Wesley immediately raised his hands and even avoided looking at the people beside him. He quickly said, Hey, guys, I'm broke. I don't have any money on me, not even $20. Please don't hurt me. Seeing Wesley's fearful reaction, Irika remained silent. Ginny, on the other hand, spoke up, Wesley, we mean no harm. Hearing the voice of a woman, Wesley finally dared to turn his head slightly and saw a blonde beauty. Feeling slightly reassured, he asked, Do I know you? Ginny stared at Wesley and said seriously, We were hired by your father to protect you. Upon hearing the word father, Wesley visibly froze for a moment. Then his eyebrows furrowed, and he slowly said, My father abandoned me the week I was born. Your father is a world-class assassin. After you were born, he didn't want you to lead a life like his, one centered around killing and being killed. However, a group of people has targeted you. They plan to use you to threaten your father. That's why your father hired us to ensure your safety. What? Wesley's face was full of disbelief. Impossible, are you sure you're not mistaking me for someone else? Ginny took out a photo from her pocket, showed it to Wesley, and then compared it to his face. She said, no mistake. Besides, I know your father. You two actually have quite a resemblance. Chapter 19, The Death of Fox At this moment, voices from the earpieces of both Irika and Ginny simultaneously transmitted Sasuke's words, Behind you, at three o'clock, there's a woman who has been staring at our target. Is she an enemy? Irika immediately flashed in front of Wesley, and a kunao slipped out of his sleeve, held firmly in his hand as he assumed a combat stance. Ginny also turned around instantly, looking in the direction of three o'clock, locking eyes with Fox. She's an enemy. Just as the words were about to leave her lips, Ginny drew her gun from behind and started firing. Bang! Fox saw Ginny and recognized her in an instant. She recognized her as the former colleague who had left the textile factory a year ago. The two exchanged fire, bullets colliding in midair, but neither managed to harm the other. The sudden occurrence of this scene filled Wesley with terror. His anxiety disorder flared up once again, causing him to immediately clutch his head and crouch on the ground. His eyes were filled with fear, and the sounds of gunshots echoed in his ears, stimulating his brain. In this moment, the gunshot seemed so loud, like thunder. On the other side, as soon as Suzuki and Lee heard Ginny's words she's an enemy, they reacted instantly and charged towards Fox's direction. However, Sasuke's speed was evidently slower than Lee's. Infinite Dance of the Dragon Suddenly, Rock Lee burst out from a corner, his figure speeding towards Fox. His velocity was so great that it created afterimages. Fox was in the midst of a gunfight with Ginny and didn't have time to turn and counterattack Lee. In the next instant, Fox felt an immense force at her waist. Bang! Lee's punch sent Fox flying forming a graceful parabolic arc in the air before crashing into a street lamp on the side of the road. Numerous ribs were likely broken, and she immediately lost consciousness. Ginny was stunned by this turn of events. She never expected Lee, a seemingly ordinary kid, to possess such terrifying strength. Despite his lack of muscular build, he managed to send a person flying with a single punch. Since joining Charles Doyle's team a year ago, this was her first mission. Previously, she had worked as Charles Doyle's secretary, responsible for gathering information and screening bounty missions. While she knew Lee was strong, she didn't anticipate him to be this formidable. His strength was somewhat exaggerated. Was he a ninja? Or was he Kung Fu master? After confirming that Fox was taken care of, Ginny holstered her gun and firmly grabbed Wesley, who was muttering, I'm just an accountant, I'm just an accountant. Speaking with utmost seriousness, she told Wesley, Wesley, these are the people who came to kill you. They're an organization, not just one person. The danger isn't over. We should call the police. The police should protect me, Wesley said, trembling. As a result of the gunfire, pedestrians on the street had scattered in all directions, but there were still some kind-hearted citizens who dialed 911 during their escape. Lee approached Fox's body. Originally, he intended to tie Fox up to gather more information from her but upon closer inspection, 
he saw blood flowing from her nose and mouth. He checked for breath but found none, Fox was already dead. Seeing Lee's inaction, Suzuki walked over and asked, Lee, why haven't you tied her up yet? At this moment, Rock Lee turned around, appearing somewhat disheartened, and said, She's dead. I didn't expect her to be so weak. I thought with it being a beranked mission, the enemies coming after us would be powerful. Rock Lee had been recruited by Charles Doyle just this year as a ninja. He hadn't been in this world for very long. When he arrived, Charles told him that this world wasn't simple and that many of them here wasn't weak. He took this lesson seriously. That's why, Rock Lee, who had graduated from the Ninja Academy a year ago, though he hadn't used his full strength, managed to incapacitate Fox with his physical techniques alone. Suzuki approached Fox to check her injuries and found that all the ribs on one side of her body were broken, probably puncturing her heart and causing her death. He then said disdainfully, the assassins here are truly weak. Irika heard their conversation through the earpiece and immediately adopted a serious tone. Suzuki, Lee, don't underestimate them. While their physical abilities might be lacking, the power of firearms is not to be underestimated. If they manage to shoot you in the head, you're done for. Rock Lee's expression turned serious, indicating that he had absorbed Irika's teachings. However, Suzuki seemed somewhat dismissive. Bullets, they need to hit him first. Although due to special circumstances he couldn't currently activate his Sharingan, he could still see bullets fired at him. Irika stepped in to support Wesley and, ignoring Ginny's conversation with the fallen enemy, spoke up, Ginny, you go drive. It's not safe to talk here. The police will be here soon. Let's move to a different location. Seeing Irika's insistence, Ginny didn't argue further. She immediately ran to where they had parked earlier and brought their prepared black Mercedes V-Class to the group. Wesley, who was being supported, was skeptical of this group. He planned to break free and escape once he got the chance. But he quickly realized that the scarred Asian man's grip was incredibly strong. No matter how he struggled, he couldn't break free from his grasp. Suzuki and Rock Lee had crossed the road and joined them, positioning themselves to protect Wesley in the middle. Soon, Ginny drove up in a black Mercedes V-Class and stopped in front of them. The seven-seater MVP could easily accommodate them all. As the car doors closed, the engine roared to life, and the vehicle swiftly left the scene. After the group had left in the car, a black sedan arrived at the site where Fox's body lay. An African-American man got out of the car, examined the scene, and then placed Fox's body in the trunk of the car. After finishing with the driver's side, he moved to the passenger's seat and addressed the man sitting in the back seat, Sloan, Fox is dead. The speaker was the gunsmith himself. Sloan looked outside, glancing at the nearby street lamp, and said, Cross betrayed us, and now he has even brought in assistance to protect his son. Clearly, our earlier investigation caught his attention. I just didn't expect him to bring in reinforcements so quickly. And Ginny. I agreed to her retirement, and yet she dared to help Cross. This is betrayal, outright betrayal. Ginny and Cross have both betrayed the Assassin Brotherhood. Return to the textile factory. We need to find out who Cross brought in and gather manpower to deal with these two traitors. Chapter 20, Charles Agency Inside the Charles Agency, the lights were on, and Wesley sat on the sofa, surveying the surroundings. Rock Lee and Uchiha Suzuki stood on either side, guarding to prevent him from escaping. Since getting off the car, Wesley, they were tasked to protect had never been well behaved, always attempting to flee from the place. At this moment, Ginny had a conversation with Irika for a while before approaching Wesley and initiating a conversation with him. Meanwhile, Irika dialed Charles's phone number. Master Charles, we've made contact with the mission target, Wesley, today. During the encounter, we came across an assassination attempt by the Assassin Brotherhood, but we managed to eliminate them. We've temporarily brought the mission target, Wesley, back to the agency. Charles Doyle, who was still awake, listened to Irika's report over the phone. He found it quite surprising to learn that the Assassin Brotherhood had dispatched assassins for Wesley. In the original storyline, the Assassin Brotherhood sent Fox to take Wesley away and train him into a top assassin, then have him attempt to assassinate Cross. There was no attempt on Wesley's life directly, he was taken away for training. He speculated that the assassins sent by the Assassin Brotherhood intended to take Wesley away, which resulted in a conflict with his team. After all, the two sides had different objectives. Who were the attackers? Do you know? 
Charles wanted to confirm whether it was Fox. Based on the information provided by Secretary Ginny, the attacker was Fox from the Assassin Brotherhood. However, he was punched to death by Lee, so we couldn't interrogate her further. Having received this information, Charles calmly responded, All right, I understand. Make sure to keep Wesley safe during this time. We'll temporarily close down the agency. We don't have any available manpower to take on new missions right now. We can resume business as usual once my current mission is complete. Master Charles, please rest assured that Team Irica will perfectly execute this protection mission. After giving a brief instruction, Charles hung up the phone. He wasn't concerned about Fox's death, though Fox was described as alluring and capable in the wanted poster, she is just immortal. Being punched to death by Lee was a rather ordinary outcome. Besides, considering that in the original plot, Fox died anyway, the timing of her death didn't matter much. It was better dying now than dying after her faith was shattered. At least this version of Fox firmly believed that his assassinations were for justice, for the future. Charles retrieved Cross phone number and dialed it. After a moment, the call was answered. Cross, the Assassin Brotherhood have made a move against Wesley. Fox died at our hands today. After a slight pause, Charles continued, How much longer do you need? Keep in mind that with one of their own dead, they might escalate their attacks. I'm not someone who likes to wait. Hearing that the Assassin Brotherhood had sent Fox to attack his son, Cross was tense. However, upon learning that Fox was killed and his son was safe, he sighed with relief. Taking a deep breath, Cross replied in a serious tone, Let's meet tomorrow. I'll brief you on the battle plan and show you the layout of the textile factory. If everything is in order, we'll move as soon as possible. Satisfied with Cross' intention to act promptly, Charles agreed. He shared his address with Cross before ending the call. On the other side. Inside the textile factory, Sloan, Gunsmith, Butcher and others gathered around a table, with the body of Fox lying before them. Sloan's expression was heavy, and he began, Today, our friend Fox has been killed. After Mr. X, Fox has left us as well. The instigator behind all this is the traitor, Cross. He betrayed his faith, his destiny and even colluded with dirty assassins to attack us. Even Ginny, who had retired, was deceived by Cross and stood with him. Sloan paused for a moment, setting the atmosphere, and continued, All of this is because Cross' name appeared on the loom of fate. Cross went mad, wanting to destroy us. How should we deal with those whose names appear on the loom of fate? Sloane's gaze swept across the people present. Destroy them. Several people spoke simultaneously. Although their voices weren't perfectly synchronized, their answer was unanimous. Upon hearing their response, Sloane nodded in approval. While the Assassin Brotherhood had numerous members, only a few were genuinely formidable, including the deceased X and Fox. The rest were those present. Gunsmith, tell everyone about the group protecting Wesley. Gunsmith then presented a stack of A4 papers with printed information. This information had been purchased from a black market dealer on their way back. On the papers you have, let's focus on one person, Charles Doyle. Charles Doyle is a registered member of the Continental Hotel. He was ranked as the second to receive the legendary title after Night Devil in the Assassin world. His codename is Ninja. In addition to being a killer for the Continental Hotel, he has his own firm which mainly handles tasks such as retrieving lost items, reconnaissance, assassinations, escorts, and security. The firm's employees include Ginny, a former Brotherhood member. Umino Irika, an Asian ninja. Uchiha Suzuki, Asian ninja. Rock Lee, Asian ninja. As Gunsmith presented the information, the members' photos and descriptions were shown. When the others saw photos of Uchiha Suzuki and Rock Lee, they exclaimed in surprise. Sloan continued, don't underestimate them just because they're young. In fact, they might be more dangerous than anyone else. The injuries on Fox's body were caused by Rock Lee. Upon hearing that Rock Lee was responsible for Fox's death, everyone reframed their perception of the two young individuals. Fox's injuries were visible to all, could a single punch really cause such extensive damage? Butcher hesitated for a moment and then asked, Are they ninja from the hand? It was a reasonable question. The Assassin Brotherhood had been around for over a thousand years, and during that time, they had clashed with the Hand, an organization based on an island nation in East Asia. For some reason, their leader at the time, along with the leader of the Assassin Brotherhood, called for a truce, and the two factions hadn't crossed paths since then. 
Gunsmith was uncertain, but Sloane clarified, they are not ninja from the hand. Chapter 021, A 10 Million Reward Upon hearing Sloane's statement that the other party wasn't connected to the hand, everyone seemed to relax a bit. However, the mention of Rock Lee, who had caused the death of Fox, cast a shadow over everyone's hearts. The power he possessed was too terrifying a touch meant death, a graze meant injury. This was especially true for Butcher, who was skilled with knives. The harm he will suffer was immense. Sloane, should we bring Cross Sun with us? The gunsmith asked. Sloan pondered for a moment before replying, Cross Sun is the only person we can think of who could solve Cross problem. They share the same blood. The gunsmith disagreed and countered, but Cross has already arranged for Charles Law Firm's people to protect his son. Do we still have a chance? Furthermore, Wesley likely already knows about his own background. Hearing the gunsmith's words, the others nodded in agreement. Sloan looked at them and slowly continued, None of us are a match for Cross, but only Wesley is an existence Cross won't eliminate. We need to bring him, nurture him, and only then can we defeat Cross. As long as Cross hasn't met with Wesley, hasn't presented concrete evidence, I have a way to make him believe us. Sloane's confidence as he spoke was unwavering. Hearing Sloane's words, there were no more objections, only a question, should we all go and bring Wesley back? Sloane shook his head, no, we need to be prepared for cross attack. If he can afford to hire people to protect his son, we can pay to have those protecting him eliminated. And we have more money than cross. Soon, Sloan and the others discussed their next plan and issued a series of reward notices to the Continental Hotel. The reward was for killing all employees of Charles' law firm, including Charles himself, totaling five people. The bounty for each was $2 million, and anyone could accept the contract. Once the targets were eliminated, the reward could be collected from the Continental Hotel. For this, Sloan had paid $10 million. Perhaps for an ordinary person, this amount was astronomical, but for the Assassin Brotherhood, which had a history spanning a thousand years, it was a trivial expense that didn't even qualify as moderate. The next day. Early in the morning, Cross arrived at Charles' law firm with a large canvas bag filled with items. Seeing Cross enter with the bag, Charles spoke, Brother, is that filled with grenades and firearms? Once in the living room, Cross placed the canvas bag on the table and opened it, revealing a stack of blueprints. He then explained, Charles, the headquarters of the Assassin Brotherhood is a textile factory at 17th Street, Brooklyn, New York. These are the blueprints for the factory. Take a look first, we'll discuss our plan of attack later. Taking the offered blueprints, Charles carefully examined them, focusing on memorizing the layout, the rooms, storage spaces, ventilation ducts anywhere someone could hide. His aim was to prevent the enemy from using hidden places for sudden attacks. As for the attack routes and specific locations to destroy that cross had marked, Charles also took note of them. Instead of using rat bombs, which he found too cruel, not because he was a member of an animal protection society, but because his exploding talismans were just as effective as the rat bombs, he realized that his exploding talismans were no worse than rat bombs. After Charles had roughly gone through the blueprints, Cross continued explaining his plan, demonstrating a device he'd made that resembled a wristwatch an explosive device that could be attached to rats without hindering their movement. While Cross explained his plan, Charles's phone suddenly rang. The caller ID displayed Ginny's name. Charles answered the call and signaled Cross to wait. Ginny, what's the matter? Charles was curious about the early morning call. Charles, I have some bad news to tell you. What happened? Just tell me straight, Ginny. Ginny's tone was serious, and she said deliberately, Charles, we're all on Continental Hotel's hit list. All of us. Charles caught onto a key word. Yes, all of us. This morning, Continental Hotel updated its hit list. Everyone from Charles' law firm is on it you, me, Irika Umino, Suzuki Uchiha, and Rock Lee. Each kill is worth $2 million, totaling $10 million. What's crucial is that this mission is open to anyone. Anyone can take it. I think Continental Hotel's assassins have already started moving. Charles, we're in trouble. After hearing Ginny's report, Charles realized that the situation had become much more complicated and troublesome. He never thought that he, too, would one day become a target for Continental Hotel's hit list. Was this the fate of a legendary assassin? Wasn't the previous $2 million reward target John Wick, a retired legendary assassin? 
he hadn't expected that an assassin organization like Continental Hotel would actually resort to putting out assassination missions of their own assassins. Have they no shame? Charles's tone remained calm and composed as he said, Ginny, don't worry. We're aware of the strength of Continental Hotel's assassins. They're not our match, it's just a bit troublesome. Protect yourselves and Wesley during this period. I and Cross will eradicate the Assassin Brotherhood as soon as possible. I'll find a way to get Sloane to cancel the bounty. Charles knew that if the bounty wasn't cancelled, the mission would remain active, attracting countless individuals seeking money or fame to come knocking for assassination. Although Charles wasn't afraid, he disliked the constant annoyance of these pesky flies. Upon hearing Charles's confident tone, Ginny didn't say much more before hanging up. The main purpose of the call was to inform Charles that he was also on the hit list, warning him from being attacked unexpectedly without preparation. Chapter 022, Ambush After seeing Charles hang up the phone, Cross's expression turned serious as he asked, Did Sloane issue a reward against you? Charles looked at Cross's inquiring gaze and replied, Cross, Sloane posted a $10 million reward in Continental Hotel, primarily to eliminate the people I sent to protect your son. I suspect they want to take advantage of the hitman's arrival to snatch your son amidst the chaos. Though my subordinates aren't afraid of those hitmen, Cross, this is still troublesome. So, for the safety of your son, I suggest we act quickly. Cross knew that Charles had his best interests at heart, but he still spoke, I need some more time. I haven't finished making my bombs, and we need a lot of rats. Charles shook his head and stated, Cross, your plan requires too much preparation time. In comparison, I have something better. Let's take action tonight. Cross, go prepare your weapons. Delaying won't be beneficial for you. Cross asked solemnly, Charles, the textile factory has a significant number of personnel. Are you really sure about this? Cross, go get ready. Tonight, you'll see the true power of a legendary assassin. Seeing Charles's determination, Cross didn't insist. He was genuinely concerned about his son's safety. Since Charles was confident, Cross was willing to take the gamble with him. As for the rat bombs, he'd use as many as he could. And as for not bringing them along, that was out of the question, they were his trump card. With the plan set for the night, Cross bid farewell to Charles and left to prepare his guns and bombs. Leaving Charles's residence, Cross headed towards the elevator. He coincidentally encountered a delivery person stepping out of the elevator, holding a box of pizza. Their gazes met briefly, but Cross paid it no mind. He proceeded to the elevator, only to find that it had already descended. He pressed the button and waited. At that moment, inside Charles's apartment, Charles had just seen Cross off and was about to carry out his tasks for the day. Ding dong. The doorbell chimed, interrupting Charles's actions. He glanced towards the living room where he had spoken with Cross, but there didn't seem to be anything left behind. Could there be something Cross forgot to mention? Approaching the door, Charles opened it to find a black delivery person holding a pizza box. Charles's eyebrows slightly furrowed, and before he could speak, the delivery person retrieved a handgun from beneath the pizza box, aiming to shoot. Acting quickly, Charles swiftly kicked out even before the hitman could fire. This kick was not only swift but also empowered by Charles's chakra. Thud. The hitman was sent flying, crashing into the corridor wall. Instantly, the wall cracked upon impact, and the hitman's head slumped to the side, lifeless. The pizza box that the hitman had been holding flew out of his hand upon impact, revealing its contents as it tumbled through the air. Damn it! Charles cursed under his breath. It was a bomb, a rigged liquid explosive device. He moved at his fastest speed grabbing the falling pizza box just before it hit the ground. With a swift motion, he flung it towards the end of the corridor. Then, he twisted his body and retreated into his room, leaning against the wall as he awaited the explosion. These actions occurred in the blink of an eye, executed at an incredibly swift pace. The next second. Boom. A deafening explosion sounded, causing the room to shake three times. Bits of wall plaster and dust fell, and the building's alarms immediately began to blare. After the explosion subsided, Charles emerged from his room and glanced at the corridor. He saw that the wall at the end of the corridor had collapsed due to the blast. A chilly breeze flowed in through the hole in the wall. Charles muttered softly, it had quite some power. Due to the abruptness of the events, Cross had yet to reach the elevator when he heard the explosion. He immediately dashed towards Charles's direction. 
Seeing Charles unscathed, Cross asked, Charles, are you okay? Charles's face was grim, and his tone carried a hint of anger as he replied, I'm fine. Cross, go back and prepare quickly. Tonight, I'm going to wipe out the damn textile factory and kill Sloane. Seeing Charles's furious expression resembling that of an enraged lion, Cross didn't say much. He quickly departed. This place had already been attacked, but what about his son's side? Cross, who initially thought it might be too early, now felt the urgency. He was itching to charge into the textile factory and annihilate the Assassin Brotherhood. He feared that if they delayed any longer, his son might be in danger. Watching Cross leave, Charles's anger was genuine this time. It wasn't just because of Sloane's bounty, but also because of the hitman from Continental Hotel. Someone had dared to make a move on him so soon. Did he, a legendary assassin, still have any face left? Especially considering the bomb that had just gone off. If it had exploded in front of him, even with these protective gears, he would have been injured. This time it was a bomb. What would it be next time? TNT? Cluster grenades? Or perhaps someone would march in with a rocket launcher? Assassins could be unscrupulous, and he couldn't rule out such underhanded methods. Sloane, you're as good as dead. Just as Charles was about to return to his room, the phone rang again. Charles, do you need help? Hearing the familiar voice, Charles's expression darkened. The caller wasn't anyone else but John Wick, whom he had saved before. And those were the same words he had said to John several times before. He hadn't expected them to be thrown right back at him. John, it's just a minor matter. I can handle it myself. Charles, what about your subordinates? Can they handle it too? You still have my blood oath medallion, you can use it. Let me protect your subordinates. Hearing John Wick's intentions, Charles was somewhat speechless. John seemed eager to put that blood oath medallion to use. John, tell those hitmen from Continental Hotel to be careful. They might be earning money, but it's their lives they're spending. As for your suggestion, John, I'm sorry, but I trust their capabilities. On the other end of the line, John Wick sounded somewhat resigned. Charles had turned down his offer, but he still said, Charles, if you need help, contact me. As for the message, I'll have Winston pass it along to Continental Hotel. The call ended, and Charles returned to his room, glancing at the dust on the floor. He muttered to himself, this place is no longer safe. I need to find somewhere else to stay. Check in. Ding. Check in successful. Reward, 50 gold coins. Do you want to upgrade to VIP4 to claim double rewards? Charles absent-mindedly tapped the X and exited the system interface. He picked up his coat, turned around, and left his room. Chapter 023, The Fall of the Assassin Brotherhood Night had fallen. Charles Doyle was currently driving a car, complaining to Cross beside him, Man, the smell of these rats in the box is really strong. Charles, don't underestimate these rats. They're all deadly weapons. If we had more time, I could have brought even more. Cross patted the box while speaking. Cross seemed quite satisfied with his creation. The Porsche KN sped down the road towards Brooklyn. The cold night air flowed in through the windows, dispelling the lingering smell inside the car. Before long, the car arrived near textile factory number 17 in Brooklyn. With a few hundred meters left to the factory, Charles Doyle brought the car to a stop. Seeing the car stop, Cross was puzzled, aren't we going to drive straight in? Let's get out. We still have a distance to cover. We'll sneak over and try not to be noticed, Charles explained. Charles, without crashing the car through the gate, there's no way we can get in. Are you planning to use bombs for directional blasting? Or did you bring an RPG in the car? Observing Charles get out of the car without heading for the trunk, Cross couldn't quite figure out what was happening. Particularly when Charles didn't seem to be carrying many weapons, it further perplexed him. Soon, Cross took out a notebook from his pocket and said, Charles, Here's the wax bath formula I promised you. Charles took the notebook but didn't read it. He simply put it in his pocket and said, Cross, don't worry about these things. I have my own way of handling it. Bring your rats and catch up with me. Both of them jogged until they reached the vicinity of the textile factory. Charles glanced at the nearly 10 meter high wall. It wasn't merely a wall, it resembled a fortress wall. Despite the night, guards were still patrolling the wall, 
and searchlights occasionally illuminated the dark corners. Charles, since you have a plan, I'll leave it to you. Cross pressed against the wall, holding a large pet carrier. Charles, oozing confidence, said, leave it to me. Once I break through the door, you can release your rat army. I'm afraid that if we wait too long, they won't have a chance. In the next moment, Charles Doyle accelerated, his figure quickly appearing at the gate of the textile factory. He nonchalantly affixed an explosive seal and then hid beside the wall. He muttered under his breath. Boom. The explosive seal ignited instantly, resulting in a deafening explosion. The explosion's diameter was a full three meters, and the wooden gate of the textile factory shattered into pieces. The explosion instantly jolted awake the numerous assassins within the textile factory. The guards responsible for the night patrol on the wall immediately sounded the alarm. On the other side, seeing the gate suddenly blown apart, Cross was left dumbfounded. He had just seen something a piece of paper with unfamiliar patterns and characters attached to the door. In less than a moment, the paper had ignited and exploded on its own. The explosiveness of it was not to be underestimated. Without hesitation, Cross rushed forward while carrying the box. As he approached the gate, he tossed the box out. In the next second, the box crashed onto the ground, shattering into pieces, and the rats inside scattered and fled. Meanwhile, Charles had already charged into the textile factory. He aimed at the guards on the wall and fired explosive seal kunal that he had prepared in advance. Boom, boom, boom. Explosions resounded continuously, and even the 10-meter-high wall was blasted down. The explosive seal kunal, equipped with explosive seals, kept shooting out from Charles's hands, flying in all directions, causing explosions to erupt constantly. At the same time, Cross, now wielding a gun, rushed in as well. However, seeing Charles Doyle's actions, he was both dumbfounded and amazed. He fired his gun while commenting, if the hand had techniques like these back in the day, the Assassin Brotherhood would have ceased to exist long ago. What is that, some kind of seal? Or a new type of bomb? Gunshots kept ringing out as Cross entered the textile factory after Charles. However, all he saw were corpses. Charles moved swiftly with Kunao in hand, cutting down anyone who stood in his way. His speed was too rapid rendering the assassins unable to land a single shot on him. Even when they managed to shoot a few bullets his way, he deflected them with his kunao. He continued his killing spree until he reached the second floor, where explosions suddenly resounded again. This time, the explosions weren't caused by Charles's explosive seals. Instead, it was Cross's dozens of explosive rats that detonated. The explosions had such force that the staircases leading to the second and third floors were destroyed by the impact. On the second floor, as Charles arrived, a bullet flew towards him. He used his kunao to split the bullet in half, causing its two parts to fly off in different directions, taking out two assassins who had been aiming their guns at him. Among them was a repairman who was attempting to shoot. When his first shot proved ineffective, he was about to pull the trigger again. In an instant, Charles's figure covered a distance of 10 meters, appearing right in front of the repairman. He struck with a punch. Boom! The repairman's head was instantly blown apart by Charles's punch, with red and white fragments scattering in all directions. The sight before him not only frightened the enemy but also shocked Charles himself. He had never used this technique on a person before, and he hadn't anticipated the immense power it possessed. The scene was also incredibly gruesome. Charles secretly resolved never to hit someone in the head again the image of an exploding head was truly nauseating. Turning away from the carnage, Charles leaped up and landed on the third floor which was a slaughterhouse. It housed Butcher, and as soon as Charles entered, a flying knife was hurled at him. Charles deflected the knife blade using his kunao. In this pitch black and eerily quiet room, numerous slaughtered bodies were hanging, creating an unsettling atmosphere. Charles had no intention of toying with the Butcher. He formed hand seals and muttered incantations. Fire style, great fireball jutsu. With a large amount of chakra input, a massive fireball, 10 meters in diameter and reddish-brown in color, instantly materialized and was hurled forward. The enormous fireball engulfed the entire room. Whether they were hanging pigs or butchers hiding within, everything was instantaneously incinerated by the flames, turning into roasted meat. Charles smirked and muttered, who said a grand fireball can't kill people. He turned around and headed toward the next room. T slash N, I don't know some of the characters that are mentioned here. If I make any mistake with their name, please let me know in the comment section. Meanwhile, 
On the other side, Cross entered the factory and noticed that most of the enemies had already been killed by Charles. He chose a different path, aiming toward Sloane's study. But instead of encountering Sloane, he encountered pesticide instead. Cross, it seems you really appreciate my research. It looks like you brought quite a few rats this time. Pesticide held a rat in his hand, the explosive attached to it having been disarmed. Sorry, pesticide. Cross didn't hold back. He lifted his hand and fired a shot, as the bullet whizzed through the air. Chapter 024, Recharge Pesticide rolled to the side, avoiding the shot. He then tossed out a rat and took cover behind a pillar, cursing, F, Cross. I was the one who taught you that trick, and you used it to try and kill me. You bastard. Cross showed no mercy. He swiftly slung his gun, and the bullet curved in its trajectory bypassing the pillar where Pesticide was hiding and instantly taking him out. At the same time, gunshots sounded behind Cross. Gunsmith held a handgun and immediately pulled the trigger on Cross. Whether it was due to a premonition or sensing the danger, Cross lunged forward, dodging the bullet. He then turned around and fired his own shot. Gunsmith didn't hold back either. While evading, he shot back at Cross. The bullets from both sides occasionally met and collided in midair. On the other side, Charles Doyle entered a spacious study. The room was vast, with bookshelves lining the walls, filled with countless books. Suddenly, Sloane and three assassins appeared behind separate bookshelves in four different directions. They all raised their guns and fired without hesitation. Bang! Four bullets were simultaneously fired from four different directions towards Charles. In an unbelievable move, Charles performed a mid-air somersault, evading all four bullets at once from seemingly impossible angles. Before the enemies could react, Charles threw four shurikens, instantly killing the three assassins excluding Sloane on the spot. Although Sloane survived, his palm was pierced by a shuriken, causing him to drop his firearm. Seeing that the danger was averted, Charles, who had landed on the ground, spoke to confirm, Sloane. Sloane covered his bleeding hand, pretending to remain calm as he said, Charles, how much did Cross pay you? We'll offer double, no, triple the price. Please help me. Charles looked at Sloan with a hint of mockery and said, Sloan, you can't afford that price. Besides, once you're dead, the property of the textile factory will belong to me. Charles wasn't joking. Sloan truly had nothing else comparable to the healing bath or the sacred weaving machines. Upon hearing that Cross had used the entire textile factory as a bargaining chip to give to Charles, Sloan immediately broke into a sweat. Then, realizing something, he continued, Charles, if you let me go, I'll cancel the bounty on your agency. How about that? And I'll give you ownership of this textile factory as well. How does that sound? Seeing that Charles remained unmoved, Sloane continued, Charles, if you don't release me, the bounty will continue to hang at the Continental Hotel. Countless assassins will swarm you like locusts. You won't be able to trust anyone. Hearing Sloane's threat, Charles kicked him to the ground and stepped on him, saying, Sloane, you'd better cancel the bounty on my agency. That way, I might make your death a little less painful. Sloane, pinned under Charles's foot, wasn't afraid. Instead, he quickly regained his composure and looked at Charles, saying, Charles, if you're unwilling to spare me, then this bounty will remain on the five members of your agency until you're all dead and the bounty is claimed. Perhaps you're not afraid of assassination, but what about others? They'll live under the constant threat of assassination. Can they really endure it? Charles, still pressing down on Sloane, stomped hard on him, crushing him to death. I, Charles Doyle, can't stand threats the most in my life. You think you can rely on those insignificant assassins to force me to spare you? Sloane, you underestimate me. With another forceful kick, Charles kicked Sloane's corpse to the doorway. At this moment, Cross, who had just dealt with the gunsmith, walked in while holding his arm wounded. He looked at the lifeless Sloan and then glanced at Charles, who remained unscathed. Cross pupils contracted slightly as he thought, this guy is too terrifying. Charles, is the bounty issue resolved? Charles shacked without much elaboration, clearly indicating that the matter wasn't resolved. Instead, he said, are there any survivors in the textile factory? Cross didn't expect an answer since Charles hadn't replied, so he continued, they've all been killed. Looking at Sloane's lifeless body on the ground, Charles asked, show me the so-called fate-weaving machine you guys mentioned. 
Hearing Charles's request, Cross looked at him deeply but didn't refuse. Instead, he led Charles to a factory. The factory was spacious but empty, with only one operational weaving machine inside. Staring at the weaving machine in front of him, Cross spoke with mixed emotions, Charles, this is the Assassin Brotherhood's fate weaving machine. Charles approached, circled around the machine, and especially looked at the back, as if checking if there was an internet cable connected to it, as some internet users had humorously speculated. As it turned out, the fate weaving machine was not connected to any network cable. Charles examined the machine carefully, trying to find some distinctive feature, but after observing for a while, he found nothing. He gently touched the weaving machine. The next second, the system that had never successfully recharged before suddenly responded, emitting a message. Ding detected special energy. Recharge is available. Do you want to recharge? Hearing about the recharge, a smile appeared on Charles's face. The fate weaving machine was indeed not a simple object, it could actually recharge the system. Without hesitation, Charles silently confirmed the recharge. The next moment, the weaving machine in front of him seemed to have its energy drained away. It aged instantly. The machine that hadn't sustained any damage for over a thousand years suddenly deteriorated as if consumed by time, turning into ashes and scattering on the ground. Cross, who witnessed this scene, was dumbfounded. He was bewildered by how the immortal weaving machine had decayed into ashes the moment Charles touched it. His eyes shifted, and he murmured, the fate weaving machine is just like the assassin brotherhood it corroded and perished together after betraying its faith. Regarding Cross words, Charles merely raised an eyebrow, not particularly concerned. He was more focused on the interface of the Naruto system in his mind. Ding recharge successful. On the system interface, the gold coins column rapidly flipped numbers, going from 100 to 500 to 1000. The numbers were constantly changing until they finally settled at 1730. Charles recharged 1680 gold coins, and his VIP level had also changed. It went from 0 to VIP 1. Seeing these changes, Charles didn't linger on the system interface for too long. He directly exited and planned to investigate further later. After all, Cross was still standing beside him. Chapter 025, Uchiha Suzuke, 140th Charles, the Assassin Brotherhood has been wiped out. How do you plan to claim this loot? Cross pointed to the ashes on the ground and the surrounding factory buildings. As Charles gazed at the ashes on the ground that Cross referred to as loot, he thought to himself, I've already claimed my loot, you just don't know it. Cross, the textile factory is yours to manage. Since you came from here, it's only fitting for you to take over. Hearing Charles's intention to hand over the textile factory to him, Cross was taken aback for a moment. He believed this was Charles's loot, especially since they had agreed before that the loot belonged to Charles. Upon hearing Charles's words, Cross expressed his gratitude, thank you then. I'll tidy up the place and check if Sloane had any hidden cash or similar things. I'll call you when I'm done. Seeing Cross' willingness, Charles nodded in satisfaction, sure, handle it yourself. The mission is completed now, go pick up your son. The two of them left the textile factory and returned to where they had parked. Charles tossed the car keys to Cross and said, Wesley is at my agency. You drive on the way back. Cross took the keys without questioning Charles's request and immediately opened the car door, starting the engine. Charles opened the passenger door, got in, and after sniffing the still lingering smell of rats, which reminded him of the sewer, he opened a window and closed his eyes to rest. Seeing Charles closing his eyes as soon as he got in, Cross drove the vehicle smoothly towards Charles's agency on Forest Hills Avenue 71, Queens District. By now, Charles's consciousness had entered the system interface. He glanced at the gold coin interface displaying 1730 and began checking the recharge records. He discovered the message, detected special energy. Recharge is available. Recharge successful, 840 gold coins. Initial recharge, gold coins doubled, totaling 1680 gold coins. Seeing this, Charles Doyle finally understood that the fate weaving machine didn't directly recharge him with so many gold coins. Instead, it leveraged the system's first time recharge reward to double the amount. However, while 840 gold coins were a substantial sum, the fact that it only raised his VIP level by one seemed exaggerated. Achieving only a one-level upgrade for the VIP with 840 gold coins left him slightly frustrated. Thankfully, 
even VIP-1 had its corresponding benefits. Charles opened the VIP-1 privilege package and gained 12,000 copper coins, 70 prestige, and one ninja recruitment scroll. Seeing another recruitment scroll, Charles was quite satisfied. This scroll was worth 168 gold coins almost a tenth of his gold coin total. Including the five scrolls he had previously, Charles now had six ninja recruitment scrolls. Glancing at his remaining gold coins, he generously bought four more ninja recruitment scrolls, making a total of ten. This cost him 672 gold coins, leaving him with 1,058 gold coins. Instead of immediately conducting ninja recruitment, Charles started contemplating. Since the fate weaving machine could convert into energy for recharging, what else could he recharge with? Dragon bones? Ten rings? Heart shaped grass? Frost casket? Eternal fire? Or infinity gems? Although Charles didn't possess these items and wasn't sure if they could be successfully recharged, he wanted to give it a try. With a goal in mind, Charles Doyle felt more confident about the future. Putting these thoughts aside, he opened the mission hall and saw that the mission to exterminate the Assassin Brotherhood had been completed. He immediately chose to claim the reward. 5,000 prestige points 500,000 copper coins, and an exquisite treasure chest. He opened the treasure chest, and after a flicker of light, a ninja shard popped out. It was clearly labeled Uchiha Suzuki from the anime. This Suzuki had just finished his training under Orochimaru. Seeing the ninja shard appear, Charles was somewhat satisfied. However, it was unfortunate that there was only one shard for Uchiha Suzuki. One should note that a B-rank ninja required 40 identical shards for combining, unless directly recruited. In an instant, Charles felt a sense of fear being dominated by collecting shards. He didn't want to think about the time and cost to gather all 40 shards for this Suzuki. Thus, he exited the system space. After Cross had driven for a while, he arrived near Charles's agency. Charles raised an eyebrow. It seemed an assassin had come to their door and was dealt with. Cross also noticed something was amiss. He quickly pulled up to the front of the agency. As soon as the car came to a stop, Charles got out and walked towards the office. Currently, Charlie was overseeing the cleanup of traces. When he saw who had arrived, he greeted, Good evening, Mr. Charles. Good evening, Charlie. Charles exchanged greetings and then looked inside the office. The lobby was a mess bullet holes, marks of grenade explosions, and evidence of chaos were everywhere. Charlie's cleanup crew was busy picking up debris, wiping away bloodstains, and preparing to dispose of the bodies. At this moment, Charles's expression grew darker. These assassins were too audacious, directly attacking his agency and even using grenades. Charles, has the Assassin Brotherhood been eradicated? The person speaking was Ginny, who had come down from the second floor. They've been eliminated. Is everything okay on your end? Charles inquired. Charlie, who was busy directing his men in the cleanup process, seemed to hear something incredulous. His pupils contracted momentarily, his body stiffening before he resumed commanding as if nothing had happened. Everything's fine. Nobody was hurt. Ginny replied, then turned to Cross, who had just walked in behind Charles, and said, Cross, Wesley is upstairs. You can go get him. Thank you, Ginny. Cross expressed his gratitude before turning and heading upstairs. This was his first time meeting face to face with the son he had always lived without seeing. Seeing Cross leave, Charles's tone remained calm as he asked, Ginny, please explain the situation. Upon hearing Charles's request, Ginny immediately began recounting the events, since this morning until now, a total of six waves of assassins have come. Just paying off Charlie for cleaning up has already cost us 30 gold coins, not to mention the expenses for renovating the agency. However, the strength of the assassins who came to the door was quite weak. While they didn't cause us much harm, it's getting tougher as more come. Some have already used grenades, and who knows if they might resort to using RPGs next. Upon hearing Ginny say that nobody was hurt, Charles's anger didn't diminish in the slightest. Especially upon hearing the mention of RPGs, his anger flared even more. However, he noticed that Irika and the others were missing. Thus, he inquired, Ginny, where are Irika and the others? Thanks for listening. <laughs>